Epilogue 55 Frank Salerno and Gil Carrillo were anxious to speak with Richard. Early on, they say, he had told them when the case had been adjudicated, he discussed the crimes he'd been charged with, as well as other murders and assaults the two detectives suspected he had done. After the sentencing, they drove over to the county jail. They checked their sidearms and lockers on the ground floor, made their way up to Ramirez's cell. When they reached the cell, Ramirez was urinating. When he realized the two detectives were there, a smile broke on his face. "'Hi, guys,' he said. At this point, the cell door was opened by a sheriff's deputy. "'You have a minute, Richard?' Frank asked. "'I've got a lot of minutes,' he said, and they all laughed. "'A prison cell is like a man's home, and the detectives wouldn't enter it without being invited. "'Come on in,' Richard offered, and they stepped inside. Richard told them he hadn't been referring to them in the speech he'd made in court. Frank reminded him he said he'd talk about his crimes after the case was over, and asked if he'd be willing to talk now. Richard said he would not talk about any crime he wasn't convicted of, citing his family as the reason, but he'd be willing to discuss the crimes for which he had been convicted. They moved to an interrogation room and began to talk. NBC was airing a made-for-television movie based on the stalker crimes. Richard said he was looking forward to seeing it. The two detectives said they'd be watching it, too. Salerno suggested they could come back the following day to talk some more and discuss the movie. Richard agreed. They discussed his sentence, his speech, the film, how packed the courtroom had been, and all the press the case had garnered. Salerno asked if it would be all right if they taped their conversation, and Richard said no. The detectives promised to come back in the morning. Could you use anything? Salerno asked, knowing the only way to get anything out of Richard was to treat him like a human being. Richard said he'd like some chocolate. Later that day, Richard was taken to the shower room and left alone. He saw a grated duct cover in the ceiling and decided to try and get it off. He couldn't move it with his hands, so he tried to kick it out of place. The sheriff's deputy on guard heard the kicks and caught Richard vandalizing state property, he wrote in his report. As punishment, Richard wasn't allowed to watch Manhunt, the TV movie he had inspired. Doreen hadn't been in court when Richard was sentenced. Daniel Hernandez had promised he'd call her at work and let her know what time to come to court, but he never did. She heard over the radio that Richard had been sentenced to death. She got pale and dizzy and nearly passed out, she later said. She was very angry at how the news people on the radio seemed happy Richard had been given the ultimate punishment. She had to see him and console him and let him know she'd be there to the end, that nothing would stop her from helping him, that she'd do anything for him. She left work, went home, and cried her eyes dry. With great effort, she then pulled herself together, put on a yellow flower dress, makeup on her face, combed her hair, set the VCR to tape the movie, and went to see Richard at the jail. Visiting hours didn't begin until 5.30 p.m. She got there at three and took her place at a long line filled with hard-eyed women and unruly children. It was very difficult for Doreen, standing there, not to cry. Two sheriff's deputies came out of the jail and asked her to come with them so they could look in her pocketbook. When the deputies were convinced she wasn't carrying any firearms or weapons, they let her get back into the line. When her turn came, she took the elevator up to the second floor, where the sheriff's deputies again searched her pocketbook, and the female deputy searched her person thoroughly. She was told she'd have to wait for all the other inmates to have their visits, then they'd bring down Richard. She sat on a bench, dazed, shocked, and stunned, for two hours, until the whole visiting area was cleared and Richard was brought out. As usual, the visit was through dirty, smoked plexiglass, he sat down as if the weight of San Quentin rested on his shoulders. Well, they did it, he said. I told you. I'm so sorry, Richard. Me too. But not for me. For my family. For my mother. For Ruth. You'll appeal it. And judging by how unfair the whole trial was, I'm sure you'll get a reversal. I don't know if I even want to appeal it. I don't want to go through another trial. Fuck that. Did you speak to my sister? I tried calling, but the phone was busy and I couldn't get through. Call tonight. Tell them everything will be all right, that you saw me and I'm okay. I will. Daniel didn't call me. That's why I wasn't in the courtroom. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. Don't worry about it, he said, and looked down. Doreen had never seen him so sad and downhearted. Tears started rolling down her face. She told him that she loved him, and in the end he'd win his appeal. He told her about the shower incident. So that's why they searched me and made me wait, you think? That's why. Did you set the VCR? Yes, of course and I'll write you and tell you about all the highlights. 
He thanked her and told her Carrillo and Salerno had come to visit. For what? she asked. Just to talk. They're coming back to discuss the movie. Be careful. Careful? About what? It's all over. No, it's not. Don't give up. You can win an appeal. Fuck an appeal, he said, and the deputies came up and announced time was up. Richard stood. He was taken back to his cell, angry he couldn't see the movie, hating what life had in store for him. In El Paso, Texas, the news of Richard's sentence hit the Ramirez family hard. They were all gathered at Joseph's house. Reporter Tony Valdez from KTTV in Los Angeles was also there. He had been kind to Ruth when she was trying to get her brother a lawyer in the very beginning, and had asked for permission to come to El Paso with a camera crew so he could capture the family's reaction to the sentence. Right after Judge Tynan had finished the sentencing, a colleague of Valdez's had run to the phone and called El Paso from the courthouse. Ruth answered and gave Valdez the phone as he ordered the cameras put on the family. The Ramirez's had turned down dozens of offers, some involving money for interviews. Only Tony Valdez was allowed near the family. He listened to his colleague say, 19 death sentences, turned to Julian Ramirez and said, Muerte, diecinueve veces. A sudden sadness enveloped Julian. He looked down and appeared like a man whose heart had been cut in two. In Spanish, Valdez asked Julian what he thought. He looked up and said, That jury may have sat in judgment of my son, but really there's only one who can judge him, and that is God. The camera moved to Ruth. I feel bad for the victims and their families, but we too have been victims. Valdez signed off, saying the family were also victims. The piece was shown on the 4, 5, 6, and 11 o'clock Los Angeles news broadcasts, and family members and survivors of the Night Stalker crimes called the station, complaining that Valdez had no right saying the Ramirez family were victims. They didn't want any sympathy extended to Richard's family. When Mercedes Ramirez left Joseph's home, she and Ruth went to church. Mercedes knelt in front of the Virgin Mary and prayed for her youngest boy's salvation. Ruth was crying too hard to be able to pray. Julian went home and sat in his easy chair, his powerful shoulders bent by the weight of Richard's imminent execution. He told Joseph and Robert he wanted to be alone. The boys refused to leave him. They were afraid their father might commit suicide. Julian looked down and stared at the floor without blinking. Tears rolled from his unseeing eyes and fell on the backs of his huge, large-knuckled hands. At seven o'clock that evening, the whole jury panel met at Juror Shirley Jones's house. It was supposed to be a party but there was a somber, sad cloud over everyone's head. It had been a very, very difficult thing for some, not all, of the jurors to render a death sentence. Regardless of how heinous the crimes were, Richard was still a human being who was going to be put to death because of our decisions, juror Martha Salcedo said. Cindy, as well as Chocolate Harris and a few of the other female jurors, felt Richard had been railroaded into the gas chamber. Cindy said she thought the Hernandezes should be prosecuted for incompetence, they had no right not putting some evidence forward when it came to the penalty phase. Los Angeles Times photographer Mike Wu was there, and he took pictures of the jurors, in which they wore serious, stern countenances. Later, when Cindy arrived home, she couldn't sleep. She felt haunted and deeply troubled by what she perceived as a terrible injustice. Her heart ached at the thought of Richard being executed because of her. She felt that had she held out, she could have caused a hung jury— she was mad at herself for allowing the other jurors to convince her to vote for death. She was also mad at Daniel and Arturo and Ray Clark for not offering any mitigating circumstance that could have allowed her to vote differently about the death sentence. She was still crying at dawn when she had to get ready to appear on AM Los Angeles along with two of the other jurors. She was on the air at 8 a.m. At the host's urging, Cindy looked into the camera and told California that Richard deserved the death penalty. But she added quickly, his lawyers had done a poor job representing him. She said she wondered what made Richard tick, and hoped some day she'd be able to meet and talk to him. Doreen made sure to catch Cindy's appearance on television. Of all the jurors, Doreen held only Cindy in disdain. She had seen the way Cindy had been looking at Richard during the trial, like she was hungry and he was food or something. She knew that Cindy had brought the valentine that said, I love you, for Richard's benefit. Gil Carrillo and his whole family had gathered at his home to watch Manhunt. He was very proud of being portrayed on television. He knew there was much more to the story the film hadn't even touched on, and hoped one day the complete story would be told the way it had really happened. 
When the movie was over, the Carrillos had a celebration. It wasn't every day one of theirs was featured in a movie. It was a proud moment, one of the proudest moments in my career, Gill later said. He had, he knew, helped root out, prosecute, and convict probably the most dangerous serial killer this century has ever known, for Richard Ramirez came when you were sleeping in your own bed. Gill shivered at the thought of Ramirez stalking around people's darkened backyards, looking in windows, salivating at the very prospect of having a helpless woman in his control. It didn't matter what age, at his mercy. He looked forward to talking to Richard some more, maybe getting some insight into what the hell made him tick, what he did to avoid apprehension. The fucker's a walking encyclopedia about murder, and I'm going to find out what he knows, he said later. Later that night, as they were preparing for bed, Pearl saw how sad Gill had become. She asked what was wrong. He sat down heavily on the bed and didn't answer. His lower lip began to tremble as if he might cry. What's wrong, Gill? she asked. I've been thinking about my dad. I wish... I wish he was here to share with me, with us, this triumph. I mean, this is my shining moment as a detective, as a man. There'll never be another case like this, a killer as bad and cunning as Richard. I just wish... I wish he were here. And with that he did begin to cry, in earnest, a thing Gill very rarely did. Pearl sat up and embraced his huge hulk. He is here, Gill. He is with you. I know it. I feel it, Pearl said. Frank Salerno did not watch the movie. He didn't want to be reminded about all that had happened. Not yet. Jane taped it for him. When Carrillo and Salerno heard Richard hadn't been able to view the movie because of his antics in the bathroom, they decided it would be a good idea if they took a tape of the film to the jail so they could all watch it together. The day after the movie had aired, they brought a bunch of chocolate bars, some popcorn, and some soda to the county jail, a VCR and a television had been set up in an interview room so they could watch the film with Richard. Richard didn't think Greg Cruz, the actor portraying him, looked anything like him, and said it appeared as if they'd put black wax over his teeth to make them look bad. Whenever a body was shown being taken from a house, Richard got excited. He thought A. Martinez, the actor playing Gill, was too small. They all got a laugh at that. Richard asked if someday there would be a book about him, pointing out that there were a couple on Ted Bundy and half a dozen on the crimes of Jack the Ripper. Salerno said he didn't know of any book deals and explained to Richard that it would help the families of crimes they still suspected him of if he would now admit them. Richard said he wouldn't talk about anything but the convictions. Carrillo asked if it would be all right if they taped what he said. He said no. They then began asking him about the crimes and how he did them. Richard gave them, the detectives later said, which Richard vehemently denies, the details of how he worked, lived, and avoided capture for so long. The detectives say he told them he capered in stolen cars, which he sometimes left in the parking lot of the Greyhound bus terminal. He always stashed away any weapon he had in the terminal lockers until he realized the car might be staked out. At that point he began driving the cars around the block a few times before he retrieved his weapons. According to the detectives, they began talking about the actual murders, beginning with Vinco. Richard told them what he knew. They weren't sure if he was bragging and making things up, but he seemed sincere, they thought. For the next week, as Richard ate sweets, he told the two detectives the details of what he said had taken place. Both detectives enjoyed talking to him. He had a likable side to him that was easy to warm to, Carrillo later said. Their meetings were brought to a halt on November 16th when Richard was taken to San Quentin. The last time Salerno and Carrillo saw him, he asked them if they were going to come to his execution. Carrillo said he wasn't sure, didn't think so. You bet I'm coming, Salerno said, dead serious, looking Richard right in the eye. San Quentin Prison was built in 1852. It is located on 20 acres of land at the foot of Mount Tam in Marin County, a 30-minute scenic drive from San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. Its south side runs parallel with the Bay of Skulls, the prison is painted a pale yellow with terracotta roofs. It comprises five different buildings, or blocks, A through F. Death Row is in E block. Since 1893, 409 people have been executed at San Quentin by hanging up to 1938, when the gas chamber was installed. Some of San Quentin's famous alumni are Carl Chessman, the Red Light Bandit, James Watson, known as Bluebeard, and C.E. Bolton, or Black Bart. In gun towers and strategic positions around the prison are expert marksmen with automatic assault rifles with scopes. They man them 24 hours a day. 
It is a very scenic, lovely spot, with palm trees rustling in the gentle sea breezes and waves rhythmically lapping the coastline. An occasional shark's fin can be seen slicing the placid waters of the Bay of Skulls. All men sentenced to die in California await their execution at San Quentin. Some of the serial killers presently housed in E-Block are Juan Corona, Randy Kraft, Lawrence Bittaker, Roy Lewis, David Carpenter, David Catlin, Douglas Clark, Mitchell Carton, and Bill Bonin, the freeway killer. These men would be Richard's neighbors. Richard was taken to San Quentin ten days after he'd been sentenced. The authorities viewed him as a security risk. They knew he had many female admirers, and they knew about the Satanists who had regularly visited the trial, and there were always rumors that someone was going to try and break him out. For security reasons, it was decided it would be better if he was flown to Quentin rather than driven. The helicopter landed on the roof of the county jail in Los Angeles and picked up Richard, and with three guards watching his every move, he was flown up north. Richard had never been in a helicopter before. He was like a wide-eyed kid with a smile on his face, intensely looking out the window, though he began to get motion sickness. Still, he liked the idea of being flown to Quentin. It made him feel important and dangerous. He was shackled at the wrists and ankles and was wearing a blue Los Angeles County jail jumpsuit. At this point, he still had no plans to appeal his conviction. He viewed the system as corrupt and hell-bent on killing him. When the time came for him to die, he had decided to commit suicide. He didn't want a whole bunch of strangers watching him kick around in San Quentin's green room. Death, as such, held no fear for Richard. More than ever, he believed in his heart that he would go to hell and sit at the right hand of Satan. He believed all the hardest criminals throughout history would be there, and he'd get to know them. Jack the Ripper, Al Capone, John Dillinger, Ted Bundy, Adolf Hitler, and all the others sent to hell for their deeds. Heaven and hell were as real to Richard as the helicopter now taking him to San Quentin. When the prison came into view, Richard sat up and stared at it. It looked, he thought, more like some vacation hotel, a club med or something. In truth, Richard welcomed the change. He'd been locked up in the Los Angeles County Jail for four years. Time was easier to do in a prison than in a jail. The visiting, food, and general conditions are much better. Richard was handed over to heavily armed, grim-faced San Quentin officials. He was put in the AC block, known as Reception. His prison number was E-37101. All prisoners, except death row inmates, were kept in reception while they were evaluated, and it was decided where they would do their actual time. Richard still had the pan assault and murder charges against him, and until that case had been adjudicated, he would not be moved to E-Block after his obligatory three-month stay in reception. He would, after evaluation, be transferred to the San Francisco County Jail to be closer to court for hearings and motions on the pan matter. Lawyers from the San Francisco Public Defender's Office would be representing Richard in the pan incident. Richard was put in another six-by-eight-foot cell with an aluminum toilet, a sink, and a bunk bed. Prisoners in reception did not have access to phones, and their visits were for only two hours a week. In E-Block, the inmates were allowed 24 hours a week for visits, and reception inmates were kept in the cell nearly 24 hours a day. Richard was assigned cell number 3AC8. Cindy Hayden was having a hard time keeping Richard Ramirez off her mind. He was all she could think of. His intense black eyes, his wavy black hair, his absolute and undeniable arrogance and danger. She dreamt of him nearly every night, often wondering if he had put some kind of spell on her. She would later say, The truth of the matter is, I think I fell in love with him the first time I saw him. I know it's nuts and everything, but I couldn't help it. It was just one of those things. A week after the sentencing, the Hernandez is asked to meet with her in the office of an attorney in downtown Los Angeles. After she'd waited for two hours, she called Ray Clark's office, hoping to locate the Hernandezes there. Clark didn't know they had requested a meeting with her. Cindy took the opportunity to complain to Clark about the defense, which she thought had been woefully inadequate. It was a sin. No evidence had been presented on Richard's behalf during the penalty phase. Why didn't you do something during the penalty phase, she demanded. Because he wouldn't let us, Clark said. He's very stubborn. When the Hernandezes arrived, they told her Richard wanted to talk with her. If she was interested, she could write him in care of San Quentin Prison, and gave her his prison number and address. Daniel then asked her what she thought of the defense they had mounted on Richard's behalf. Cindy Hayden laid into the Hernandezes, saying they had done a terrible job of defending Richard, that they hadn't had enough experience, that they'd missed the most crucial element to their client's benefit. When Daniel asked what that was, 
She told them it was Satan. She believed Richard had been possessed by some demonic force when he'd committed the crimes, and they'd not even mentioned it, let alone tried to highlight it as a viable defense. It was something the jury should certainly have known about, she said. When she got home, Cindy wrote Richard a long letter, saying how sorry she was about the death sentence, and tried to explain that she and the jury as a whole had had no legal alternative but to vote for death. She mailed the letter and anxiously waited for a response, which took only four days. Richard wrote her back and said he understood that she shouldn't feel bad about anything, not to beat herself up, and asked her to write him some more and maybe even come and visit. Cindy was thrilled when she got his letter and immediately wrote him back. The day after Richard left for San Quentin, Gil Carrillo left for Waikiki for a vacation with Pearl, the kids, and four other couples. After ten days, he went back to work. He couldn't help wondering when the next serial murder case would come his way. During this time, Gil began thinking about running for sheriff. He had gotten a lot of publicity because of the stalker case, and there were certain things in the sheriff's department that he would like to see changed. He talked it over with his wife, who said if that's what he wanted to do, she'd support him. Something was wrong with Frank Salerno. The problems had begun at the end of 1989 and had escalated. He'd started experiencing dizzy spells, then vertigo so bad the room would seem like it was spinning and he'd have to sit down. He went to his family doctor, thinking there might be a problem with his inner ear, but the doctor couldn't find anything wrong. The dizziness and spinning not only continued, but got worse, and he developed insomnia. He told Captain Grimm, who sent Frank to see his own doctor, who did a complete physical. When the results came back, the doctor had bad news for Frank, which hit him very hard. Frank had high blood pressure and had developed a heart problem called arrhythmia. He told Frank he needed a lot of rest, little excitement, and to change his diet, no meat, no cheese, no fried food. Frank was forced to take a leave of absence, which proved to be very hard for him at first. He was a homicide detective through and through. Chasing and capturing killers was his passion in life, and now suddenly that was all taken away. The first time Ruth Ramirez saw Richard after the sentencing, she had come up to Los Angeles by bus, then, with Doreen, flown to San Francisco. Ruth felt Doreen really loved her brother, and Richard had told Ruth he could trust Doreen. When Ruth saw the first editorial piece Doreen had written defending Richard, she really believed Doreen was in Richard's corner, a hundred percent, and accepted her as if she had been a childhood friend or a sister. They drove to San Quentin and had to wait eleven hours to see Richard. There were always many prisoners in reception with a lot of visitors. The prison's facility for reception visits was small, and ten to fifteen hour waits were the norm. When Ruth finally did get to see her kid brother, she was surprised at how well he had taken the death sentence. It didn't seem to bother him, she'd later say. Richard was, though, concerned about what his parents were going through. Ruth told him they were not taking it at all well. Mercedes often cried at night, and their father was quiet all the time never smiled and seemed to be drifting away. He doesn't look well. His diabetes is getting worse, she said. Tell him I said this is a bunch of bullshit, that I didn't kill anyone, that this is all a big railroad job. I'll tell him, Ruth said. Richard thanked Doreen for helping his sister, for waiting so many hours for a visit. She told him she'd do anything for him, that she loved him. Both Ruth and Doreen told Richard to appeal the conviction that he could win an appeal on grounds of incompetent counsel, Richard said he'd think about it. The following week, Doreen flew to El Paso to meet with the family. She stayed with Ruth. After a dinner at Julian and Mercedes' house, Julian took her aside and thanked her for being so dedicated to Richard. He told her he would like to see her and Richard get married. 56. In February 1990, Ramirez was moved to the San Francisco County Jail, where he had access to a phone and a television and interacted with other inmates. Almost immediately he got into a fight over the phones and beat up some guy who'd called him a punk. Richard knew he couldn't let anyone abuse him in any way, for the abuse would surely get worse and more than likely end up as an assault against him. He was quick to let everyone in the jail know if you bothered him, you'd better be ready to fight to the end. This resulted in his being left alone, and he could do his time without being bothered. Now that he had access to a phone, he called Cindy Hayden Collect, and they talked for the first time. She felt like an errant schoolgirl getting involved with the bad kid in the neighborhood. As a result of this first phone call, she thought he was sweet and shy and funny. 
nothing like the monster who had committed the murders and assault she had heard about for so many months. Richard told Cindy he loved her. She was surprised and taken aback. You don't even know what love is, she said. You are right, he said. I don't. I had no one on the outside. Do you love me? There was a long pause. She laughed nervously, then said, Yes, Richard, I do love you. He invited her to come visit him in San Francisco, and that weekend she went to see him. The visiting situation was much better at the county jail, and Cindy waited only an hour before they brought him out. They spoke to one another through plexiglass and over the phone. Cindy later said she was so nervous her hands were shaking. Her heart was beating so hard she was afraid it would explode. He told her he was very happy she had written him. He had wanted to talk with her since the very beginning. Blushing, she said she had fallen in love with him the first time she'd laid eyes on him. She cried and apologized for voting to sentence him to death. He told her to forget it, that he understood. She told him she wanted to hold him, to have him inside her. He told her maybe she could come with his lawyers when they came to visit. They'd then be able to have physical contact. Their time was up. When Cindy left Richard that day, she felt truly alive for the first time. As she flew back to Los Angeles, she thought about moving to San Francisco so she could be closer to Richard. For the first time, she realized why she had left her husband and Portland, Oregon. She felt that being with Richard as near to him as possible was my destiny. As it turned out, it was very difficult for Frank Salerno to stay retired. After six months of recuperation, regularly swimming, hunting, and fishing, he told Jane he was feeling much better and wanted to return to work. He wasn't experiencing the vertigo any longer, his heart condition had stabilized, and he had no trouble sleeping at night. When he went back to work, though, the job wasn't the same. Something had gone out of it, he'd later relate. He began to think he might have done it all when it came to homicide work, and maybe it was time to quit. A deputy sheriff was murdered, and Frank, as an acting lieutenant, was put in charge of a task force of ten men to try and find the killer. Running this task force, however, was apparently too much for Frank, for he again started experiencing the dizziness and vertigo and shortness of breath. Jane didn't want him working homicides any longer and told him it was time to put police work behind him forever. He had to agree with her. He was still a relatively young man and could, he knew, have a long, wonderful life if he got away from Sheriff's homicide. In August of 1993, Frank Salerno, the famous bulldog of Sheriff's homicide, retired from police work for good. Jane thought it would be fitting if he had a retirement party, and with Frank's approval, she and Jackie Franco, a colleague of Frank's at Sheriff's Homicide, organized a huge affair at Stevens Steakhouse in Commerce. They invited all of Frank's friends and former colleagues and their wives, his and her families, and it turned out to be over 300 people. Among the guests was Whitney Bennett and her family. Whitney had grown into a very beautiful young woman, with honey-colored hair and large blue eyes. She had gone through a number of plastic surgery operations to correct the damage done to her by the tire iron, and one was hard-pressed to see any scars. At the party, Jack Scully, Frank's ex-partner and master of ceremonies, introduced her to the audience, including Mike Salerno. From the first time Mike had seen Whitney the day she had testified at Richard's trial, he thought there was something special about her. Later in the evening, he asked her if it would be okay if he called her, and she said yes and gave him her number. A few days after the party, Mike did in fact phone Whitney, and they began dating. The two hit it off very well and soon were deeply in love. It didn't take long for Mike to decide he wanted to be with Whitney forever, and he asked her to marry him. She said yes without hesitation. When Mike told his parents he and Whitney were getting married, Frank Salerno was a very happy man. He already cared for Whitney like she was his daughter, and this news put a huge smile in his heart and on his face. When Gil Carrillo heard Mike and Whitney were getting married, he too was overjoyed, saw it as maybe the only good thing that had come out of the Night Stalker case. Cindy Hayden continued visiting Richard every chance she got. She'd come mostly on weekends when Doreen was visiting too. The two women began seeing each other at the jail. Doreen felt Cindy was a low-down, hypocritical bitch who could have hung the jury. Whenever Doreen saw Cindy at the jail, she would narrow her eyes and regard her with utter disdain. When Doreen asked Richard why the hell he would allow that Benedict Arnold to visit, he said she was a juror and might be of help if he chose to appeal his conviction. After a few months of Cindy driving all the way to San Francisco every weekend, she began thinking she would move north permanently so she could be close to Richard. 
She was in love with him and had pictures of him in frames on her night table and on the wall opposite her bed. Cindy had told her parents about her relationship with Richard and had actually brought her mom and dad to the jail so they could meet him. When Richard first sat across from them in the visiting booth, Cindy said, Mom, Dad, this is Richard, as Richard smiled shyly. I know you've heard some bad things about him, but he's got a lot of good points, too. Richard sheepishly said hello, waved, and began talking to Cindy's father, who, like his father, had worked for a railroad. They had something in common, as Cindy later put it. Cindy agreed to do several national talk shows, Donahue once and Geraldo twice, and told the world in a very passionate voice that Richard Ramirez had improper counsel and his convictions should be overturned. Some of the groupies who had been visiting Richard in Los Angeles now began to go to San Francisco to see him. Doreen was unhappy with all the competition she had. She'd complained to him that they were taking visiting time away from her, but Richard enjoyed all the female attention. Never before had he had so much female admiration, and he reveled in it, thrived upon it. Cindy, unlike Doreen, didn't mind Richard's other visitors as long as none of them bothered her. But there was one woman Cindy and Doreen came to refer as the bimbo, who did, in fact, start getting aggressive with both Cindy and Doreen. The bimbo, a heavy-set, well-built, belligerent blonde with frizzy hair and a big nose, began to challenge Cindy and Doreen when she ran into them at the jail. He's mine. Stay away from him or I'll break your face, she'd say regularly. Cindy stood up to her telling her to fuck off. But Doreen did not have Cindy's combative nature and would take Bimbo's threats, taunts, and admonitions. The Bimbo began regularly to step on Doreen's toes and call her Dog Green. It got to the point that Doreen began asking the jail guards to walk her to her car. She was so afraid of the Bimbo. Doreen again complained to Richard, but he didn't stop the Bimbo from coming to the jail. Several of the Ramirez women would bring phallic-shaped vegetables with them on their visits and would sexually excite themselves with the vegetables while Ramirez watched. For many of these women, Richard Ramirez was a turn-on. The fact that he was so dangerous and so close, yet couldn't hurt me, got me excited as soon as I sat down for a visit, one Ramirez groupie would later admit. It was like the beauty and the beast kind of thing. Cindy Hayden wanted to be able to touch Richard, hold him and be close to him, and she constantly thought of ways she could make that happen. When her employer had a mass layoff and she was fired, she decided she would become a private detective. If she had a detective's license, she'd be able to work with Richard's new San Francisco attorneys and have a visit with Richard in a private room. She applied for a job with a San Francisco security firm, was hired, and moved to San Francisco. She took a quiet apartment in Richmond. The security firm sponsored her for a license, and she passed the required examination. She went to one of the San Francisco public defenders representing Richard and talked him into taking her inside the county jail with him when he went to visit Richard. She and the attorney were shown into one of seven rooms allocated for lawyers who come to see inmates. It was ten by ten and had a wooden table and a few chairs. There were panels of glass and a wall so guards could look in. As Cindy waited for Richard to be brought down, her heart raced. She paced back and forth, her hands trembling. When Richard got there, the guard uncuffed him and he sat at the table. They were like two school kids, laughing and giggling. Under the desk, she raised her foot and put it on Richard's thigh. His eyes bulged. He couldn't believe he was actually sitting with one of the jurors who had handed him a ticket to the death room. After a few minutes, Cindy later related, the attorney went to look for a bathroom. When he left and Cindy was sure there were no guards about, she stood and quickly gave Richard a deep kiss as he groped her with his huge hands. She nearly passed out. She was so excited. When later asked if she was afraid to be alone with Richard, she said, No, absolutely not. He'd never hurt me. When the lawyer returned, Cindy sat down, breathless, her heart pounding. On subsequent visits to the jail, as she helped with Richard's legal problems, she says, she was able to have more contact visits and was actually alone with Richard. Gil Carrillo decided to run for sheriff. He felt there were grassroots changes he could make which would vastly improve the efficiency of the sheriff's office. His platform would be that of a detective who had intimate working knowledge of the problems inherent in any huge police department. He took a leave of absence in the spring of 1994 and began campaigning intensively. Pearl and his sisters pitched in and helped run his campaign office, made mailings and hung up posters. His opponent, Sheriff Block, had become a giant in L.A. law enforcement. 
Gil's going up against him was akin to David taking on Goliath. Gil lost in the primary and dropped out of the race. As a result of his involvement in the stalker case, Gill is often asked to speak to police agencies around the country, including the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia, and he always warns his colleagues to never discount any possibility when it comes to serial killers. Gil Carrillo is presently working homicides out of the East L.A. station. He is not at all bitter about losing the election. He always knew it was a long shot, but he had to give it a go. Today he is again trying to solve Los Angeles homicides, enjoying the work as much as ever. 57. Doreen continued to visit her true love on weekends and whenever she could get away. She wanted to move to San Francisco, but couldn't because of her magazine job. Whenever she saw Cindy, her stomach would turn. She'd later confide, I knew she was up to no good and really wished she'd just get lost. Doreen acted as Richard's confidant and secretary, took care of his correspondence and passed messages to his lawyers and family. Often he received mail from all over the country, and Doreen helped him with his letters. He'd call her collect from the San Francisco jail, and she'd play heavy metal music for him over the phone. She put what money she made as an editor in his commissary account and did whatever she could to help him. When asked if she ever thinks about the crimes Richard was convicted of, she says, When you love someone, you only see the good in them. And that trial was a travesty of justice. Doreen's family was quite displeased with her for getting involved with the likes of Richard Ramirez, but that didn't put a dent in her feelings for him. He was her sunset and sunrise, as she puts it, and she hopes one day to be Mrs. Ramirez. Indeed, she says Richard has asked her to marry him, and she's accepted. Richard was becoming a problem for his San Francisco jailers. He was having just too many female visitors, some of whom argued and fought with one another at the jail. A current affair learned of Richard's admirers and did a story about all the fans coming to see him, which they appropriately called Death Row Romeo. It was decided Richard should be moved back to San Quentin for security reasons, the county jail told the press. On September 21, 1993, Richard was returned to San Quentin. He didn't want to be there, for he'd be housed in the Adjustment Center, where visits were exceedingly limited, he had no access to the phone, and he was locked up almost 24 hours a day. Doreen finally decided she had to be closer to Richard, and she moved to the San Francisco area and got a job as a caretaker. Although she didn't have to drive the seven hours from Los Angeles anymore, in order to have a visit with him, she now had to go to San Quentin in the early morning hours to get a number. There were only three shifts of thirteen visitors each visiting day for inmates in adjustment. Visitors' days were Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Doreen was regularly waiting ten to twenty hours to get into the prison for a thirty-minute visit through glass over the phone, though she didn't mind. She'd sit in her car, eating sunflower seeds, and write him love letters as she watched the sun come up, glistening like fire on the Bay of Skulls. With a job and someone she had to account to, she managed to see Richard only on Sundays, her day off. Likewise, Cindy Hayden had to wait many hours for her Saturday visit. Richard tried to keep the two of them apart. They are, he laments, like oil and water. Doreen kept pressing Richard to make Cindy and the other women stop coming, especially the bimbo. But her demands fell on deaf ears. At times, Doreen would get so mad she'd leave San Francisco and go back to L.A., but inevitably she returned to Marin County. She realized Richard wasn't the most rational person, and she fervently hoped he'd see how much she loved him and make her his bride. She'd later say, I'm not just another one of his numbskull girlfriends. I believed we were getting married. I mean, otherwise I'd have left. When she pressed Richard for a specific date for them to take vows, he'd put her off. He'd tell her he loved her and that she was the only person he trusted outside his family, which was true. No matter what, Richard knew Doreen would do anything for him. When recently asked if she believes Richard is innocent, Doreen said, I've always fervently believed in his innocence. I can't even conceive of his being guilty of the terrible things they say he did. He received an unfair trial with very inadequate legal representation. Some day the truth will be known. Julian Tapia Ramirez took his youngest son's plight to heart. After the conviction and sentencing, his diabetes progressively worsened. He lost weight every week. He had tomatoes and chilies growing in the backyard, but he stopped tending them and they died. His broad, powerful shoulders were shrinking and rounding. 
More and more lines formed on his high cheekboned face. Nothing Mercedes did or said could bring Julian out of the deep depression that followed Richard's sentencing. The only thing that put a gleam in his eyes that he looked forward to was being with his grandchildren. Like her husband, Mercedes had been devastated by the death sentence. She aged twenty years in the months following her son's sentencing. Deep, bitter lines like cracks and fallow soil completely mapped her face. She, too, lost weight. She went to church religiously every day and fervently prayed, eyes closed, hands clasped, for the salvation of the family. Julian was diagnosed with bone cancer in the spring of 1991. The cancer spread quickly, and he died of it on August 16th of that year. Julian's death crushed Mercedes. Life without Julian wasn't worth living, and she surely would have died of a broken heart. But she had to be there for Richie, and wasn't about to give up until she'd done all she could to help him and the rest of the family. Joseph's children were stigmatized by being related to Richard. It was no secret the feared Night Stalker, now even more famous than John Wesley Harding, was their uncle. There were always taunts and rude remarks at school, though the children acted like they didn't notice the pointed barbs thrown at them or written on their lockers. But they knew what was said, and it hurt them deeply. Troubled, they went to Joseph and complained to him. He'd tell them just to ignore those stupid people, though he remembered only too well the mean things that had been said to him as a child. He prayed his children would be thick-skinned. Richard's oldest brother, Reuben, turned to heroin and found solace in its numbing embrace. He felt responsible to a degree about what had happened to his kid brother, and after the death of his father, he very rarely smiled. Ruth never remarried. She lives with her mother and daughter in the Hacienda Heights house. Whenever she can, she goes to visit Richard. No matter what, Ruth will be there to the end for her baby brother. I love Richie to death. We were always the closest in the family, she would later relate. If they kill him, I'll go crazy. Joseph has a good job designating maintenance people at the Fort Bliss Army Base. He has many commendations, plaques, and awards. He works hard every day and goes to church several times a week. He still has much difficulty getting around, but he does his best and rarely complains. He, too, visits Richard when he can, twice a year or so. But it is a difficult trip for him, though he gladly makes it. Joseph loves Richard dearly. He gets a heavy heart and is brought to tears when he thinks of his brother's fate. Joseph, like Richard, Robert, and Reuben, often gets migraine headaches that are so bad he must lie down in the dark. You can't even talk to me when they come. It's like having hot needles in your brain. Robert still lives in Marenci, Arizona, working in its mines. He is divorced now and sees his two daughters on weekends. When he can, he drives to El Paso to see his mother and his siblings. He has stopped using drugs and avoids trouble at all costs. Cousin Mike, the person most people believe put Richard on the path he traveled, died of a massive heart attack in April of 1995. He was overweight and still haunted by the ghosts of things he'd done in Vietnam, regularly using heroin. The Army gave Mike a hero's burial with a 21-gun salute. For the first time since he'd been arrested, Richard has excellent, very competent legal counsel in the form of five foot seven Michael Burt with the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. Bert is a handsome, natalie-dressed advocate who knows the law backward and forward and comes to court very well prepared. He was one of the lawyers who helped defend Lyle Menendez in his first trial, and he represented the very infamous Charles Ng, who, with Leonard Lake, tortured, sexually assaulted, and killed dozens of people in front of a video camera on a ranch in Wesleyville, California. The San Francisco District Attorney had been planning to try Richard for the Pan murder, Many in law enforcement say it was a waste of taxpayer money. However, when Bert had extensive psychological tests done on Richard, for the first time, and moved Richard's plea from not guilty to insanity, the San Francisco district attorney backed down. He said they would prosecute Richard only if he won an appeal in the L.A. convictions. Jerry Russell, out of San Diego, is Richard's appeals lawyer. She, like Bert, is an excellent attorney who leaves no stone unturned. She believes Richard has a very good chance at getting a reversal and is presently working hard on perfecting his appeal. There were many major mistakes, the least of which was incompetent counsel. The Hernandezes should have never been allowed to represent anyone in a capital case. If, indeed, Richard wins the appeal, he will have to be brought back to the L.A. County Jail and tried all over again, a very daunting, unsettling prospect for the L.A. District Attorney's Office. 
The appeal, Russell says, won't be ready until the end of the century, and by then it will be nearly 20 years after the crimes, which would put the prosecution at a huge disadvantage. Witnesses die, move away, and forget details. Today, Frank Salerno has adjusted to his retirement. He has no heart problems, the vertigo is all gone, and he sleeps well. He doesn't miss being a homicide detective at all. I did it all and saw it all. There just wasn't anything left I'd not done. I got out just in time. It takes its toll on you. You think you are okay, but it breaks you down. Murder is not a healthy occupation. Often, Frank is invited to speak at police seminars about the stalker and the hillside strangler crimes around the country. He feels obligated to tell people in law enforcement what he learned about apprehending serial murders as a result of all the experience in the two huge cases. He recently said, What makes serial murder cases so difficult to solve is the fact that the killer and the victim are strangers. You've got two ships passing in the night, and for no good reason, one blows the other out of the water. Today, Ramirez is still sitting in his cell in the Adjustment Center at San Quentin, waiting for his appeal to be argued, getting visits from Doreen, his family, and other supporters. He says he was railroaded and has hopes in the appeal. He has changed much in the eleven years since August 1985. He's gained thirty-five pounds, and he's mellowed out. The seething anger he often expressed in court seems to be filed in a place he now has control over. But by no means has he adjusted to the reality of his existence. He does not like being in the adjustment center, saying it's cruel and unusual punishment, and he often paces his cell like a caged panther. He recently said of his predicament, I don't know how much longer I can hold out in here. This existence sucks big time, boring as hell. No drugs, no pussy, might as well be fucking dead. Check this out, a little bit of philosophy. Desire comes from the loins, emotions come from the heart, and knowledge comes from the head. When not pacing, Richard writes letters and reads books, everything he can get his hands on about murder. He's become quite the expert on killers and killing. Richard believes he will win the appeal, win at a new trial, and be set free. He still has faith, as strong as ever, in Satan, and believes he, Satan, will ultimately make him victorious and free. In early 1995, when Richard was coming back to San Quentin from court appearances on the Pan matter in San Francisco, the prison's metal detector went off. The guards searched him thoroughly and couldn't find any contraband, yet the metal detector still sounded when they passed him through it again. Officials put him in front of an X-ray machine and discovered he had a handcuff key and a hypodermic needle in a little vial hidden in his anal cavity, a very common practice in jails around the world known as keistering. Because of this incident, the San Quentin guards these days watch Richard Ramirez very carefully. When Richard was asked recently how to avoid becoming the victim of a serial murderer, he said, You can't. Once they're focused on you, have you where you are vulnerable, you're all theirs. Dahmer used to invite you home for a drink, and the next thing you knew, he's eating you. Same thing with John Gacy. He put on his clown face, do a couple of tricks, and suddenly he had you handcuffed and in his control. What people can do is not trust someone you don't know, and to always be aware of what's going on around you. When you drop your guard, that's when a serial killer moves. 58. The Wedding Thursday, June 27th of 1996, Richard Ramirez was moved out of the Adjustment Center to San Quentin's East Block, Death Row, where he would be allowed regular contact visits with his family and friends, the first since he'd been arrested. His attorney, Michael Burt, had been writing letters to the prison for many months, demanding that Richard be taken out of the Adjustment Center. His family had been praying for that, and Doreen wanted him to be moved more than anything in the world, for in East Block, Richard Ramirez would be allowed to wed. Richard had taken the bimbo off his visiting list, and had told Doreen that if he was moved to East Block, he would marry her. Since the first time she'd seen Richard on TV being taken away from the angry mob on Hubbard Street, she had wanted to marry him, to fight his battles, to be known as Mrs. Richard Ramirez. That day Doreen went to the prison for her regular Thursday visit, but was told that Richard had been moved. Moved to where, she asked the guard. Don't know yet, she was told curtly. Doreen had always been afraid that something terrible would happen to Richard while he was at San Quentin. She knew it was a dangerous place. Men were being killed all the time in fights with other prisoners. In a panic, she went back to her little apartment in San Rafael, 
and sat by the phone, hoping, praying that Richard had been moved to East Block. She sat by the phone, not eating or sleeping the whole night. As each hour passed, her heart sank lower, and the knots in her stomach grew tighter. As dawn slowly broke in the east, she looked out the window. A low, gray sky hung over San Quentin like a funeral shroud, portending something ominous. At 8 a.m., the phone rang. She jumped at the sudden sound, nearly falling out of her chair. It was Richard calling from East Block. When he told her he'd been moved, she cried with joy, almost unable to believe she would actually now be able to touch him for the first time. He told her that his cell was smaller in East Block, and that he didn't know anyone there, and was very uncomfortable. There were, he said, some very infamous serial killers in the cells to either side of him. Randy Kraft, Juan Corona, Lawrence Bittaker, a.k.a. The Pliers, because he ripped off the nipples of his victims with a pair of pliers. Doreen was so excited she could barely hold the phone. She said, Well, now that you are there, are we getting married? I said, he said, We would and we will. Promise? Promise. Oh, Richard, I love you, she gushed, crying uncontrollably with joy now, gasping for breath. He told her to put away all the tears and come on over to the prison. I'm on my way, darling, she said, and in a whirlwind of activity, her heart pounding away as if she'd been running, she showered, did her hair, put on her makeup, and a new special flower dress she'd been saving for this occasion, and ran out the door. She jumped into her car and sped over to the prison, went through security, and with trembling legs and sweating hands, walked the 150 yards from the front gate to East Block. Just above the entrance to the short, squat, red-brick building streaked with water stains stood a serious-faced prison guard, affectionately cradling a glistening blue-black assault rifle. He held it, she thought, as if it were a small child. She wanted to wave to him, to say hello, but she knew Richard wouldn't like that. And she walked up to the East Block's tall door. A guard opened it electronically from the inside. She gave him her driver's license and visiting pass, and with hesitation walked slowly into the room where all death row inmates have their visits. It was two hundred feet wide and fifty feet deep, the walls industrial gray, a hundred hard orange plastic chairs were bolted to the gray cement floor in neat rows going left to right. On her right there was a bank of coin-operated machines that dispensed coffee, candy, hot soup, and sandwiches, even foamy cappuccino. Nearly all the chairs were filled with the condemned and their visitors. Wearing their Sunday best, children of the convicts ran about. Doreen's eyes quickly scanned the room. Richard was not there yet. She recognized women she'd met over the years, visiting with their men. One or two waved to her, small, sedate movements. Doreen recognized notorious Los Angeles gang member and serial killers whose faces had been plastered all over the newspapers and television. She was so nervous her stomach felt as if there were huge butterflies fluttering about in it. Then, off to her right, on the far wall, a thick steel door opened, and there, suddenly, was Richard Ramirez. She couldn't believe her eyes. She walked slowly toward him, as if he were a mirage that might disappear any moment. When people in the room realized who was abruptly among them, there was a hushed silence. Richard had not walked free among men, women, and children since the day of his arrest one hundred and thirty-two months ago. Eleven years, she thought. He looked like a spooked deer caught in the headlights of a speeding car. He had to wear glasses now. They were silver, large, and round, making his dark eyes appear huge, owl-like. He spotted Doreen and slowly moved toward her. As she got closer to him, Doreen felt as if she might faint. She reached out and embraced him. He flinched at her touch and led her to a corner of the room where there were two empty seats. Awkward, uncomfortable being around people, he sat. Doreen kept thinking he would disappear any moment. She couldn't stop crying, which annoyed Richard, and he kept telling her to put away the tears. I can't. I'm sorry. I'm just so happy. She reached out to caress his face. He recoiled. He was not, she'd later tell a journalist, accustomed to being touched affectionately. He again told her they would be married, and they talked about getting his family up from El Paso. Marriages on death row occur every four months, and Richard promised her he would tell the prison to put him down for it. The next time they'd be able to wed, he said, was October 3rd. Before she knew it, her time was up. They embraced goodbye, and she said she'd be back the next day. Now that Richard was in E-Block, he could have contact visits from 8 to 2 p.m., 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The thought of being able to spend so much quality time with Richard made her head swim. When she arrived home, feeling as if she were walking a foot above the ground, she called Richard's sister Ruth in El Paso and told her the wonderful news that Richard had been moved and that they were going to be wed on the 3rd of October. Ruth, too, cried with joy, congratulating her soon-to-be sister-in-law. She, Ruth, knew how much Doreen wanted to marry her brother, and she was truly happy for her. She thought also that Doreen would be a positive influence on Richard, certainly a world better than the other women, the Satanists and freaks, that had congregated around Richard since his arrest. They made plans for Ruth to come up a few days before the wedding day, so they could spend some time together and Ruth would be able to hold her baby brother. As if it were yesterday, Ruth remembered Richard as a little boy who used to love to dance to the radio. Thinking of him like that, with his wide-eyed innocence and easy smile, made her heart roll over in her chest. When Ruth hung up with Doreen, she told her family the good news. Her brother Joseph said he wanted to go to the wedding, and he immediately arranged to take time off of work. His older daughter, now seventeen, wanted to come. True to his word, Richard did ask prison officials for permission to marry Doreen on October 3rd. They gave him a form to fill out, which he promptly did, listing Doreen as his fiancée. According to the California Penal Code, prisoners have the legal right to marry. The prison approved Richard's marriage, and his and Doreen's names were added to the list of ten inmates marrying that day, three from death row. It was quickly pointed out to a curious journalist by San Quentin's Public Relations Department that prisoners on death row do not have the right to conjugal visits. Doreen had to have an appropriate wedding dress and went from store to store searching for one. I wanted something plain, not a gown with a veil, anything like that. I've seen women in bridal gowns at the prison, and they, well, they look silly. Mine, I decided, would be simple and plain, and, of course, white. Doreen was, she would tell anyone who asked, a virgin, and she would, she said, wear a white dress proudly. Richard knew I'd never been with anyone else. I'm sure that's one of the reasons he asked me to marry him. A suitable dress, though, was much harder to come by than she imagined. She finally found the right dress at Macy's. Tasteful and appropriate, it was satin and lace, knee-length with a wide neck, and cost $145. Next, she had to shop for the rings. She drove to San Francisco for them and picked out two simple wedding bands, hers gold and Richard's platinum. When later asked why Richard told Doreen not to buy a gold ring for him, he said, because Satanists don't wear gold. The press got wind of the wedding on Saturday, September 22nd. The first reporter to contact Doreen was Marsha Ginsburg of the San Francisco Examiner. Doreen, for the most part, was very distrustful of reporters and what they thought of her impending marriage to Richard, but Marcia assured her that the piece would be respectful. Doreen agreed to an interview, and the story ran on the front page of the Examiner's Sunday edition. The headline read, Night Stalker Gets Virgin Bride, Death Row Wedding, and the article went on to describe Doreen as a Catholic who vowed to retain her virginity until marriage. It says she loved the Satan-revering Ramirez from the first time she saw him in 1986 and doesn't believe he committed the crimes. The examiner's story hit like a bomb in northern as well as southern California. It made all the wire services, and overnight the Night Stalker wedding was the hottest story on the West Coast. Reporters descended on Doreen like hungry vultures with no table manners, she would say. They soon found out where she lived and staked out her house. But she saw them and took off, checking into a nearby hotel. Not able to get an interview with her, the reporters started interviewing her neighbors, told them Doreen was marrying the Night Stalker, and asked what they thought of that. An outrage. She needs a good doctor. How does that cold-blooded killer get married after killing people's husbands and wives? What he should be is shot like a rabid dog not getting married. Goes to show you, our society is going to pot. It's a travesty of justice. It's a dirty, rotten sin, were some of the responses. Even the Los Angeles Times did a story, a front-page piece by Pam Warwick. The Times headline read, I saw something that captivated me. Jay Leno began doing skits on the upcoming wedding. He did four consecutive nights of jokes. On one show, Leno said, They had the actual wedding cake, and a big cake was dramatically wheeled onto the stage, and the groom on top of it had wild hair holding a long knife over his head. The audience howled. 
However, victims of stalker attacks were outraged that the person who stole their loved ones' lives, their dignity, who beat, raped, and robbed them, was getting married, was having a happy day. A system, one said, that allows such a perverted, disgraceful travesty to take place is truly wrong and should be changed, must be changed. It's an outrage. Indeed, victims as well as a lot of police officials, including Attorney General Dan Lundgren, phoned the prison and demanded the wedding be cancelled. But they were all told it was Ramirez's right by law and they couldn't intercede. Governor Pete Wilson said he would look into changing the laws right away. CNN picked up the story and ran it every half hour on headline news. It became the lead-off piece on every news show on every channel, day and night. Doreen Leoy had become very hot news, and reporters searched high and low for her to no avail. On the days before the wedding, she couldn't even leave her hotel room. Richard's sister flew up and stayed with her. They watched all the news shows, and Doreen didn't like the things reporters were saying, but she knew she'd become a target, a big red bullseye, when word of her imminent death row wedding went out. Reporters soon found out she had a twin sister named Donna living in Burbank, and news trucks lined the block where her sister resided. They relentlessly phoned her and knocked on her door. The Burbank leader did a big cover story with a 1973 photograph from Doreen's yearbook at Burbank High. Donna had always been afraid that the public would find out about her sister's relationship, and now it had become world news, the last thing she'd wanted. She wouldn't leave her house. She was so ashamed. But she did tell Therese Moreau at the Burbank leader during a phone interview our only connection is that we were born together, but other than that, we have no ties. She called her sister in San Rafael and told her she'd been disowned by the family. From this day on, you are not my sister, and you will not ever be allowed near my kids. That, of all things, hurt Doreen the most, the loss of her niece and nephew. She loved children, yearned to have some of her own, but knew that was an impossibility and had made her sister's kids her own. After all, she'd later say, my sister worked and I used to watch them all the time. I loved them so much. But for Doreen, to be known as Mrs. Richard Ramirez was worth any sacrifice. Once I was married to Richard, I would have a new family. His family would become mine, she proudly told a journalist covering the wedding. The day before the wedding, which was scheduled for 8 a.m., the press descended on San Rafael, the home of San Quentin. CNN sent a crew, as did Inside Edition, hard copy the Associated Press, and all the local and Los Angeles news outlets. Doreen was so nervous she could barely sit still. She paced back and forth, watching the news shows about her and her wedding, and critiquing every piece sharply. It wasn't until 3 a.m. that she finally went to sleep, but was up at 6, primping herself, putting on makeup, and doing her shoulder-length auburn hair in big, fluffy curls. The day was gray. Fog rolled in from the Bay of Skulls and hung a foot above the prison grounds. Doreen, with Ruth, Joseph, and his daughter, left the hotel for the prison at 7.45 a.m. She knew there would be a lot of press outside the prison, but she wasn't prepared for the hundreds of reporters all pushing and jostling to get at her, and the satellite news trucks all over the place. She turned her face and refused to answer questions tossed to her as she made her way through security at the front gate entrance. The prison public relations man, Lieutenant Vernell Crittenden, a polite professional with a smooth, easy way about him, had let the press set up microphones near the post office just outside San Quentin grounds. He told the reporters he'd hold a press conference after the ceremony and that he'd ask Doreen if she'd talk to them. The press were not allowed in the death row visiting area. Ramirez's marriage was getting much larger coverage than such lead news stories as Mark Furman's pleading guilty to perjury, even the Middle East crisis that October week. Doreen and the wedding party entered East Block under the watchful eye of a prison guard, cradling an assault rifle, wearing tortoise-shell mirrored glasses. When they entered the death row visiting area, Richard was summoned from his cell. On this, his wedding day, he was wearing a baggy, light blue, long-sleeved shirt. He appeared thin and moved with the sure grace of a cat. This was the first time since his arrest he'd be able to touch Joseph and Ruth. When he entered the room, they rushed to him and he embraced them both. They cried. The guards did not intercede. They knew the family was innocent of anything and didn't want to intrude on this very special moment for the Ramirez's. On death row at San Quentin, it's live and let live. If you behaved, the guards were polite and courteous. 
Doreen, never letting go of Richard's hand, moved to a corner of the visiting area, along with the Ramirez's, and sat on the hard plastic chairs. Joseph could not stop crying. He wished their father could be there, to hold and embrace Richard, welcome him back to the family. Richard couldn't get over how big Joseph's daughter had gotten. The last time he'd seen her was when she was just a little girl. She smiled as she looked at her infamous uncle, more like he was some kind of rock star than her father's brother. After all, Richard was just about the most famous person from El Paso, and his celebrity had not been lost on her. Soon, other death row inmates were brought in from their cells for their visits, and the room filled up with convicted killers. Richard made his niece cover her legs. She was wearing a short skirt, and he didn't want the other inmates looking at her bare legs. The ceremony took place at 11 a.m. Mr. L. Weister, a civil servant, would perform the ceremony. He was a tall, robust man with a big, healthy red face and thick gray hair. Doreen was very nervous. Richard wanted to get the whole thing over with and get back to his cell. An author and one of Richard's attorneys joined the wedding party. In front of an alpine mural one of the inmates had painted, the ceremony took place. It was short and sweet. They did not say until death do us part. They exchanged vows, wedding rings, and it was over in two minutes. Richard gave Doreen a peck on the lips. Vernell Crittenden asked Doreen if she would talk to the press. He said they would probably not leave her alone until she spoke to them. Richard told her she'd better give a statement, and she reluctantly agreed. Soon Richard went back to his cell, and Doreen and an author walked out together. The family stayed behind because none of them wanted to be on camera. When the press saw Doreen walking toward them in her white wedding dress, they hurried en masse toward the exit area, anxious to get footage of her for the news shows that evening. When she arrived at the gate, four huge prison guards gathered around Doreen and the author and walked them over to the makeshift podium as the reporters surrounded them. With resolve, Doreen stood behind the podium and addressed the throng of reporters, cameras, questions. The sky had cleared and the bright October sun was in Doreen's eyes. Squinting, she told the press, Thank you all for your patience. I just want to say I'm very happy to be married to Richard. I ask you please to let me go in peace and enjoy my day. She stepped down from the podium, got into a waiting car, and pulled away, speeding toward her destiny as Mrs. Richard Ramirez. Special Update of the 10th Anniversary Edition Often people ask me why I wrote The Night Stalker. Why the hell would you want all that negative crap in your head? This is a long, involved story, but to make it short, in 1992 I was intent on writing a novel about serial murder that truly would portray what goes on inside a serial killer's mind before, during, and after a murder. I planned to simply lay out in a compelling, suspenseful way the building blocks that make a serial murderer. I am a staunch believer in doing research, getting out in the world and seeing for myself what's going on, and talking personally to the players who know the truth. Toward that end, I began contacting convicted killers on different death rows around the country, intent upon shining light on this little-known dark phenomenon, amongst whom were John Gacy and Ted Bundy. Some were interested in talking with me, others weren't, though little by little I began piecing together the hardcore realities, the building blocks, if you will, of what serial murder is about. My friend and agent, Matt Bialer, suggested I contact Richard Ramirez, the notorious Night Stalker, who in 1985 held the entire state of California in a grip of fear unparalleled in the annals of crime history. I am a born and bred New Yorker, and didn't live in Los Angeles when the Stalker was, at will, entering people's homes in the middle of the night, tearing, ripping, beating, and shooting them to death. But I did remember how incredibly brutal his crimes were, and that he was a Satanist, which I found particularly interesting and compelling. I wrote Ramirez. He responded. We corresponded by mail for a few months. I invited him to call Collect, which he did. Quite to my surprise, I found him to be open and forthright, and oddly enough, he possessed a keen sense of humor. He agreed to meet with me, and I was soon on a plane to San Francisco, and met Richard at the San Francisco County Jail, where he was being held because of crimes he was charged with in San Francisco, the rape of Barbara Pan and murder of her 62-year-old husband, Peter Pan. I had press credentials and was able to meet with Richard one-on-one -on -one in a small conference room. I arrived first. It took about twenty minutes for him to be brought down. When he got there, I was surprised at how big and fluid-moving he was, cat-like, and his hands were enormous, the largest ones I'd ever seen. 
These were, I knew, hands that had done terrible, unspeakable things. They were like two malevolent vultures fluttering about before him as he spoke. I had seen crime scene photos of the Night Stalker's victims. Heads had been nearly severed, eyes cut out. Some victims were beaten so badly they were not recognizable as the people they once had been. We talked for a few hours. Richard agreed to tell me the truth. I returned to New York and wrote a proposal for the book, sold it to Kensington Publishing, and I was soon back on a plane to California. Richard, however, had been moved to San Quentin's death row and was only able to have visits through plexiglass. Friends of mine in the NYPD Police Academy, where I had lectured numerous times, wrote a letter to the warden of the prison on my behalf, and thus I was able to sit alone in a small room with Richard and pick his brain. Altogether, I spent three weeks with him, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. I made it a point never to judge Richard or talk down to him. I treated him just like another guy, and like that I was able to get inside his head with a flashlight and see what was going on. I found him to be surprisingly bright and well-read. He clearly had a deep, reflective, introspective side, which in my mind made him all the more interesting. Here now, for the first time, is part of my death row interview with Richard Munoz Ramirez, California's dreadful, infamous Night Stalker. Carlo, let's give it a couple seconds for the thing to start. Okay, it's February 8th, about 9 a.m. I'm inside of San Quentin Prison's death row with Richard Ramirez. So, Richard, we'll be discussing some topics. You were just talking about death and what it means to society. Would you continue? Ramirez. Uh, now I'm freezing up. Carlo, so you find death funny? Ramirez, no, I just think society is fascinated with death. Instead of giving it just a little part in this project you're doing, you should devote enough space to it because... Carlo, what about How We Die? What's that about? The book How We Die you told me about. Ramirez, it talks about how people take death in. Today, today's society... Long ago, it was taken as a spiritual thing because birth and death are two very major events, not only in the person being born and also dying, but in the people around them and the legacy that we leave behind. In today's society, it's more of the scientific and medical aspects that are most talked about in death. And in this book, it tells about how different people die and different ways of dying. Carlo, different cultures? Ramirez, different cultures, I believe. I've read reviews on it. I haven't read the book myself. I've read reviews, and it says there is such a thing as a death rattle. There is such a thing, and it is a spasm of the voice box. Carlo, you mean it's like the last breath? Ramirez, yes. Tape shuts off. Carlo, about this death rattle, I've read about it a lot myself, but I've never heard it. Have you heard it? Ramirez gets up and starts to walk out. Carlo, hey, come on back. Ramirez, no, I haven't heard it. Carlo, describe Ramirez. What I think it would sound like? Carlo, yeah, man. Ramirez, it's the last breathing out. It's one last breath out. I don't think it's one's last breath in. Carlo, the last breath out. Ramirez, right. Carlo, and what does it sound like? Ramirez, I assume, I suppose it, whoever is witnessing such a thing, it is sort of like the spirit leaving the body at the same moment this breath is given. But, uh, okay. Some people actually fight, cling to life. Some people even ask permission from their loved ones if to die. See, because they don't want to leave their loved ones. Carlo, what does the rattle sound like, and why? It's the last breath going out, but does it affect the voice box? Ramirez, it is a spasm of the voice box. Carlo, it's a spasm of the voice box, I see. Ramirez, yes, I would assume it doesn't sound like any breath we take during our lifetimes. It is sort of like when a baby is born and he is slapped on the bottom, he takes a deep breath in. These things are to me mystical and spiritual, in that we don't experience them every day. When these things happen, we take notice. We have to. I don't think it's possible to not detect such things unless you're really stupid. Carlo, speaking of spirituality, let's talk about Satanism. There's been a lot in the press, Richard, about your devotion to and your affiliation with Satan. Can you tell me a bit about what Satan means to you? Ramirez, what Satan means to me. Satan is a stabilizing force in my life. It gives me a reason to be. It gives me an excuse to rationalize. There is a part of me that believes he really does exist. I have my doubts, but we all do, about many things. Carlo, 
When did you first turn away from Christianity? As I know, you were brought up a Christian and turned to Satanism. Ramirez, from 1970. Well, throughout my childhood and up to the time I was 18 years old, I believed in God, 17, 18 years old. Then, for two or three years, I became sort of like an atheist. I didn't believe in anything. When I reached the age of 20, 21, thereabouts, I met a guy in jail, and uh, he told me about Satan, and I picked it up from there. Richard had been arrested for stealing a car. I read books, and I studied, and I examined who I was and what my feelings were. Also, my actions. Just like the Hezbollah and different terrorist religious organizations around the world, it is a driving force that motivates them to do things, and they believe in it wholeheartedly. It had the same effect on my life. Carlo. In other words, their spirituality was what was the driving force in their life, and Satan became, in a sense, your spirituality and the driving force behind you. Ramirez, yeah, exactly. Carlo, Richard, do you believe that Satan helps people who... Tape shuts off. Richard, do you believe that Satan helps people to be able to do things they wouldn't normally do? For instance, in Matamoros, Mexico... Adolfo Constanzo killed many people, and he was committing human sacrifices to protect the Hernandez drug cartel down there from the police. And he fervently believed that Satan would protect him, and so therefore made human sacrifices. Do you feel that kind of reasoning has any place, Ramirez? Place in Satanism? Carlo. Yeah. Ramirez. I don't know the structure of hell itself, or demons, or demonology, but I do know when you tamper with witchcraft, when you tamper with Satanism, be it voodoo, Carlos, Santoria, Tayo, Meombe, Ramirez, yeah, any type of sacrifices or contacting the spirits, you're dealing with things that are very delicate and dangerous. I myself am no warlock, I'm not a wizard, I'm not one of these types of individuals that knows his witchcraft from A to Z, but I have heard and read of instances where people end up getting killed and uh, arrested for tampering with the wrong demons and not using the right types of, uh, the right process of sacrifices and the right types of rituals. You have to know what you're doing. Everything from ropes to chalices. Carlo. Everything has to be done right. Ramirez. Exactly. From what I know, certain symbols like pentagrams are supposed to protect you from the demons themselves. Carlo. Yeah. You were seen in court once with a pentagram inside your hand and you held it up and showed it to the press and the audience. Why did you do that? Did you feel that it would protect you? Or were you just making a statement that you were in alliance with the devil? Ramirez. Yes, it was a statement that I was in alliance with the evil that is inherent in human nature, and that was who I was. Carlo. Richard, tell us about the Marquis de Sade. I know that since you've been incarcerated, which is about eight years, you've been reading an awful lot, and one of the things you've read is the Marquis de Sade. Richard. De Sade had a large, um, a large somewhat large following in his time. He had a philosophy, a way of thinking that was contrary to what people of his time thought, and eventually he paid the price for it. They placed him in an insane asylum where he died. His belief was that there was pleasure in painful sex. He wrote many stories, short stories. One of my favorites was Justine. He talked about the governments and how there were oppressors. Carlo. Hypocritical? Ramirez. Huh? Carlo. And hypocritical? Ramirez. Hypocritical. Takers away. They took away rights that belong to individuals. Carlos. Sexual rights? Sexual freedoms? Ramirez. Yes. Carlos. But essentially de Sade was a sadist, right? Ramirez. Yes, yes. He liked to inflict pain. Carlo. He liked to inflict pain. Ramirez. Inflict pain. Carlo. Right. Do you feel he was ahead of his time, in a sense? Do you feel he knew something about human nature and explored it that other people seem to deny? Ramirez, well, I believe that, as time goes by, mankind will find new and different ways of living. Let's see, and uh, he may have been ahead of his time, or maybe he just came about at the right time with his ways of thinking. Carlo, I believe they had the death penalty in the time period de Sade was alive. Ramirez, I think it was the guillotine. Carlo, the guillotine. Ramirez, I think this, he, uh, all this took place in or about France. Carlo, they did not give him a death sentence for his practices, but they indeed locked him up for the entirety of his natural life. But, Ramirez, because of the stories he wrote. Carlo, because of the stories he wrote? Ramirez, I believe. Carlo, they went against society. 
But what are your feelings about the death sentence, Richard? Tape shuts off. So, Richard, over the last ten years or so, there's been a lot in the press, and there indeed have been a lot of people arrested all over the country for committing what amounts to a series of murders. These individuals are called serial killers because they kill in a series of crimes. Would you tell us why you think there's such a phenomenal number of serial killers being identified and captured these days? Ramirez, you asked me why I think there's an abundance of serial killers, right? Carlo, in society today. Ramirez, right, in society today. I believe that uh, tension in the workplace and also lack of jobs and the way families are, are brought up and child abuse. Sure, it's like a recipe. Drugs, poverty, child abuse. All this creates angry individuals. And then again, lust killers. People tend to lump all serial killers in the same category, but there are different types of serial killers, as you know. Carlo, what are the different types of serial killers, Richard? Ramirez, some serial killers kill prostitutes. Some serial killers kill young boys. Uh, some serial killers kill homeless people. The only common denominator is that they kill people over a span of time. They keep on killing, and, uh, Carlo... The phenomenon of serial killers. Is it a sexual thing too, Richard? Is sex part of the crimes? Ramirez. Sex? For some serial killers, sure. For some, it is the very act of killing another human being that is that uh, that is sexual to them. It's a bloodlust, I guess you can say. Carlo. Do you think a person who becomes like that is responsive to a bloodlust because of genetic propensity or because of environmental influences or both? Ramirez. Both. Very good. You ought to be... Tape shuts off. Carlo, you think it's a combination of genetic and environmental influences? Ramirez, yes. Serial killers and most killers in general have a dead conscience. Carlo, when you say a dead conscience, that means they don't respond. Ramirez, no morals, no scruples, no conscience. They are... Uh, they sometimes... Some of them don't even care if they live or die themselves, and they are just the walking dead. Carlo, the first really noted serial killer was Jack the Ripper. Ramirez, yeah. Carlo, he killed seven prostitutes in London in the 1800s. Ramirez, yes. Carlo, I think there were other serial killers loose and participating in those types of activities, but they just never got the press that Jack got. Ramirez, Jack the Ripper created an aura around himself, or maybe the media did. Carlo, the press. Ramirez, but it was one of mystique and uh, a sinister character who was never identified. I remember in my childhood reading about him, and I was intrigued by the way this uh, killer, Jack the Ripper, was depicted. Where's a black cloak? Carlo, right. Ramirez, fog. Carlo, right. Ramirez, nighttime. Most of the time, the media tends to, if not glorify, but paint him in a way that is very sinister and diabolical, and to some of us, that is appealing. Certainly it was to me tape shuts off. Carlo, why do you think it was particularly appealing to you? It seems appealing to everybody. Ramirez, well, not everybody. Carlo, people are interested, though. Ramirez, sure, I mean, they're interested, they're curious, but I don't think you could call it, I don't think they would call it appealing. I think people are, some people are fascinated by looking at how other people, such as killers, become who they are and how there are different types of people in the world. Certainly madmen in the world are something to look at because they are very, they are a minority in numbers. Carlo, do you think Jack the Ripper was a madman? Ramirez, a madman? Carlo, yeah. Ramirez, some say he was a doctor. I couldn't say. Carlo, was he a psychopath? Ramirez, a psychopath? Carlo, yes. Ramirez, I could not tell you. I couldn't say. From what I've read about him, certainly he, if you came into his hands, and if you were a woman, certainly you would think this guy was mad. He would butcher you. He would cut your organs out and stuff and lay them right beside you in a very precise manner. A uh, madman, yes. There are certain types of mental illnesses, mental disorders that would characterize him as a madman. Carlo. Richard, how would you suggest that people can become, can avoid becoming the victim of a serial killer? Ramirez, there are ways. Carlo, how can society protect itself? Ramirez, there is no protection against a mass murderer, if you will. A mass murderer will come onto the scene, whether it be a post office, supermarket, restaurant, and open fire. Unless the bullets miss you, you will become a statistic. 
A serial killer, if he's looking for certain type of women, certain type of victims, and you happen to match his preference, it is possible that you could get away. You could even help in apprehending him, but it is said serial killers are very intelligent, otherwise they would not... Carlo, they would not be able to commit crimes over a long period of time. Ramirez, exactly. What constitutes a serial killer right now is four murders or more, according to the FBI. Four murders is not that many, but that's what characterizes a serial killer. I suppose to avoid being a victim is... Carlo, being aware of the environment? Being aware what's around you? Ramirez, taking precautions, locking your doors, having your keys ready when you open doors, being on guard. Carlo, your keys ready when? Ramirez, when you open doors. Carlo, look over your shoulder. Ramirez, yes, of course. One cannot live one's life like that in today's society, always aware. Especially if you haven't already been the victim of a crime. When you were the victim of a crime, a violent crime such as an assault or mugging, then throughout your life that will be at the back of your mind. Those types of people are more aware than those who have never been the victim of any type of crime. But sure, a serial killer takes opportunities in the victims being in the right place at the right time. He takes advantage of that. Carlo. In other words, people are a victim of circumstance. But how can a woman be more insulated and more protected from a serial killer? Ramirez, it's not possible, because to detectives, to apprehend a serial killer, they need to get inside the mind of the serial killer. Normal, ordinary people do not think like a serial killer. They have no conception of what is going on in a killer's mind, how he operates. They don't read, which is rightfully so. If they have a life to live, they're not going to spend a lot of time reading up on killers if that's not in their interest. Certainly, serial killers and killers have the advantage in that they use the element of surprise, uh, darkness and such things as this. Carlo. I see one of the conventional ways police manage to apprehend people who kill one another is usually the victim is known by their killer. But in serial murders, the victim is not known by their killer, and therefore the conventional aspects that help homicide detectives... Tape shuts off. Do you think one of the reasons why serial killers are so successful in their crimes and are able to go on for years and years is because the police are not equipped to deal with this new phenomenon of serial murder, in that they don't have systems set up to help identify, categorize, and apprehend? Ramirez. Once they have a suspect, because of the progress that has been made in forensics and all the new other evidence-gathering techniques, once they have a suspect, there is a good chance they will catch the serial killer, because we all leave particles of ourselves wherever we are. So, yes, it is difficult for the police. They are at a disadvantage because these are stranger-to-stranger stranger crimes, and it will always be so. I don't think that can change. Carlo, you mentioned that people always leave a bit of themselves behind, and with today's technology, it makes it somewhat easier for them to identify serial killers. In an instance where a naked body is left out in a field, and uh, there are no clues left behind, it becomes virtually impossible, doesn't it? Ramirez, yes. Carlo, right. Can you suggest, Richard, to women out there, Ramirez, okay, there is no set rule, there is no proof positive that once you come into contact with a serial killer that you will survive the encounter. There is no assurance of any of that because every individual is different and the same goes for every serial killer. Some serial killers will let you live if you talk to them, if you get to them, if they get to know you. Some serial killers will take pity while others won't. This not only applies to serial killers but killers in general. Some killers are hell-bent on just killing regardless of circumstances or situation. They have made up their minds even before they encounter you, and uh, there is no way out of it. The victim is at a disadvantage because she or he does not know the mind of the killer or what he is thinking. Carlo, you once told me that... Tape shuts off. About what they call the devil's dandruff, cocaine, which is really prevalent in society today. What are your thoughts on cocaine, Richard? Ramirez. I love it. Laughs. No, well, if you look at it in broad views, it's a supply and demand type of thing. I saw a show not too long ago where the CIA, I believe, actually had been working with this stuff to get arms to the Contras and stuff like that. That's on a big scale. But on a street level, I think cocaine is addictive, and I think it's very harmful to the body. Carlo. What about to the mind? Ramirez. To the mind, sure. It depends on how you ingest it. If you mainline it, I've heard and read that it can cause brain clots that lead to strokes. Sure, it's harmful. 
but the sense of pleasure it gives is very profound. Carlo, what would you compare that sense of pleasure to, Richard? Ramirez, there is nothing, to me, anyway, that comes near it. Carlo, you once described it to me as an intense euphoric heat, a rush, a light tingling that goes to the brain. Ramirez, exactly. Carlo, your feelings about capital punishment in this country are very profound. Ramirez, you better take away that CIA shit. Tape shuts off. Carlo, your feelings, your opinions about the death penalty in this country are profound. Would you tell me your feelings about the death sentence? Ramirez, as far as the death penalty is concerned, I think it is a power against the powerless. There are not many millionaires on death row. A lot of people choose to die, though. A lot of people, a lot of murder defendants, actually get on the witness stand and tell the jury that they want the death penalty. They would rather die than spend the rest of their lives in prison. The death penalty is, to me, is not a very dignified way. They should have gladiator arenas like in the old Roman times, because what I... It's just, you know, it doesn't seem right. Carlo, do you think that the government does not have the right to take a life? Or do you feel that in certain crimes... Ramirez, well, they're doing it for the victims. If the relatives of the victims want the killer's blood, uh, I think one of the relatives should pull the plug, the switch. But they leave it up to the state, and uh, that is something to look at. I've given it a lot of thought, and I've written some things down, but I don't have... Carlo, how do you feel about it only being in 13 states, as opposed to it being in every state across the board? Ramirez, right. Well, the way crime is going nowadays, it'll probably end up being in a lot of states in the future. People in different parts of the country feel differently about it, and it's ultimately up to the people in every state. They vote for it, and some states vote yes, and some vote no. They don't want it. Carlo, Richard, do you think the death penalty is a deterrent? Ramirez, no, no. Most criminals, the majority of criminals, kill for money, to get money for drugs. Some are not in their right minds, some are drunk. They kill for greed, lust, and things like this, and, uh, so no, I don't think it acts as a deterrent, because a criminal rarely thinks about his own death when committing a crime where such emotions as rage and hatred take hold of him. So very little thought is given to his own demise when such feelings are raging inside of him at the time that he commits a murder or a crime. Tape shuts off. See, governments kill with impunity, and sometimes they choose killers to go out and kill people for them. They justify it. They rationalize it. They pin medals on killers. Well, if you don't have a license to kill for the government, they won't pin a medal on you, but they'll put you in the gas chamber. Carlo, do you think the gas chamber is cruel and unusual punishment? If a state has to have the death penalty, which way do you think is the best way to go? The electric chair, lethal injection, or the gas chamber? Ramirez, that is up to the individual on which way he wants to go. Carlo, Richard... As we sit here, you've got nineteen death sentences on your head. Ramirez, yeah. Carlo, if, after your appeals are all exhausted and the day comes when you have to be executed by the state of California, which way would you choose? Ramirez, me, myself? I don't really care, because death is death, and it is said that no man knows his own death. Sure, for a few minutes you might feel it, but then you're gone. I've really not given much thought to that. To me, death is death, and whichever way I choose to go out, I'll choose it when the time comes, if there is a choice open to me. Carlo. Certain of the most notorious serial killers produced by society are Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Henry Lee Lucas. What do you think of a guy like Ted Bundy? Ramirez. Say what? Carlo. What do you think about Ted Bundy? Ramirez. See, when serial killers come up in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, these are media centers of the world. That's why more attention is paid to these guys, because of where they are located at. I've heard of serial killers in the Midwest who you've never even heard of, but they've got twenty, thirty murders under their belts. As far as my views on Ted Bundy, was that your question? Ted Bundy was intelligent. He, he grew up and he found, in his mind, his own pleasures. These were his pleasures. A man's own pleasures are his own business, I think. He, he liked to do what he did, which was kidnap women, have sex with them, torture them and kill them and whatever else. On the outside, to whomever he met on the street, he seemed like a very normal man, one you would never suspect of doing such things. Carlo. It seems that many serial killers on the outside seem very innocuous, like the guy next door. For instance, Jeffrey Dahmer. 
Of all the things he looks like, he does not look like a killer. What are your feelings about a fellow like Jeffrey Dahmer, who on the outside seems so normal, but inside is far from normal? Ramirez. I guess you could say, like, the balances of the mind, the chemistry, the psyche of a killer, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and he has learned to perfect it. Uh, this is a guy you'd think it'd be okay to go to his house, have a drink, and smoke a joint. But it would be your last drink, because you'd find yourself handcuffed, and the next thing you know, this guy would be eating you. This is a very, uh, very interesting thing to look at in life. These types of individuals, because they're extraordinary, it's sort of like a strange car, a strange house. You ask yourself, how was it built? How did it get here? I've always been fascinated with killers, and crime, and murder, and death. I suppose I started when I was twelve years old, the murder of Jesse by Richard's cousin Mike. I started reading crime detective magazines and stuff like this, and even the pages had a certain scent to them, a certain smell to them. It was very strange. It gave me a strange feeling. Carlo, can you explain the feeling? Ramirez, strange, because I had experienced the death of people I knew at an early age. I was four or five years old when I knew about a death of a friend of my father's. Then, when I was nine, I went to my grandfather's funeral. It's just, death had a very profound effect on me when I saw it. Death of my dog, death of a pet animal, just death. Carlo, do you feel that there's a life after death, that there really is a heaven and hell? Ramirez, I couldn't say for sure what there is, you know. I can't sit here and tell you, yes, there's this or that, because I'm not sure. I can only speculate. Carlo, well, what do you speculate? Ramirez, I think there is a divine force that is out there. I also believe there's a malevolent force that is out there. Then again, they could be one and the same. I also believe some in reincarnation. I mean, how do these child prodigies come about? A young child being able to play the piano very well at the age of three years old. Everything is open. I have an open mind. Carlo, do you feel that evil can be reincarnated? Ramirez, I hope so. Carlo, like a killer, like Jack Ripper, could come back in the form of Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer? Ramirez, yes, especially if Satan grants that wish to the individual. If Lucifer gives his unworthy servant that opportunity, that chance, Satan would be saying to me right now, Yes, you are unworthy. Author's note, because he was caught. Carlo, Richard, what are your feelings and opinions about women who are drawn to mass murderers and serial killers? It seems to be a phenomenon, somewhat prevalent in society today. Ramirez, a short comment on serial killers is that, is it a recipe that is created in their existence, or is it a bad seed, chemistry, genetics? Carlo, is it environmental, you're saying? What do you think? Ramirez, that's a good question. Is there such a thing as a bad seed when a baby is born? Is he already a serial killer, already made? Or is he created by his own deeds and feelings throughout his life and his environment? Carlo, it's a new field of science, but the connection between genetic propensity towards violence as opposed to our environmental influences, indeed it's been proven and established that without certain chemical balances, people have much greater proclivity towards violence, sexual deviance, drug abuse, alcoholism. Ramirez, I've heard that a lot of serial killers, John Gacy, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, have had head trauma, head injuries when they were young. They were knocked out, and so, like I told you the other day, I saw a show, 48 Hours, where this doctor came out saying that there are pieces of brain, areas of the brain, that are not functioning right. So that's always a possibility. Carlo, getting back to women who are drawn to serial killers and mass murderers, what are your feelings about that? Why do you think that happens? Ramirez, women. When I was on the street, I was a loner. I stayed to myself. I really had no contact with people. It's only been since I've been in prison that I have really developed relationships with people, and mostly women, though I now see that they have feelings, they have emotions. I mean, I always did, but I suppose I locked it out most of the time. I didn't think about other people's feelings and needs. Carlo, these women that you're making reference to, do you think they were drawn to you because of your notoriety? Ramirez, oh, they're drawn to me for all sorts of reasons. Carlo. Such as what, Richard? Ramirez, to get something out of me, to question me. Maybe they're intrigued by murder or murderers. Some are religious, some are sympathetic, you know. They have sympathy for me. Some come just so they can tell their friends they came and talked to me. 
They've come to me from different walks of life, these women. Carlo, since your incarceration, which has been eight years now, how many women would you say have come to visit you? Ramirez, nine years come this August. What was your question? Carlo, how many women have come to visit you since you've been arrested? Ramirez, it doesn't matter. Carlo, six hundred? Ramirez, it doesn't matter. Carlo, it doesn't matter. Tape shuts off. Okay. Tape shuts off. Okay. Do you think that child abuse has anything to do with the development of serial killers? Ramirez. Oh, it has everything to do with development of all malfunctions in the adult life. Child abuse in its many forms can, uh, produce many forms of, uh, life's miseries and griefs as an adult, you know? Mental disorders and such. Me, myself, I've never experienced child abuse. Carlo. You're laughing now. Why? Ramirez. No, wait a minute. Tape shuts off. Not more so than anybody else, Phil. Carlo. Well, so... Tape shuts off. You say a lot of people think serial killers should be studied. Ramirez. Right. Carlo. What do you mean? Ramirez. Well, I've seen on TV a lot of people speak and say that serial killers should be studied. Me, myself, I care about my life, and already my life went downhill. It's already in the shit right now. I don't really give a fuck, you know what I'm saying? I don't concern myself with those types of decisions anymore because they have no effect on me. I'm on death row. So whatever society wants to do, they can do, you know? The legislators, the senators, all the lawmakers, they're the ones that make the decisions and the laws. Carlo. What's it like living on death row, Richard? Ramirez. Death row? Carlo. Yeah. Ramirez. It is monotonous. It is boring. Because it is so boring, it breeds tension. There's a lot of tension in here. Frustration. You never get used to it. I myself only tolerate it. I have acquaintances. No friends. Every day it's the same routine. The walls close in on you. It is like, uh, some people, though. Every individual has his own program, has his own way of dealing with being incarcerated. Some can, it doesn't affect them at all, or so they say. Me, myself... I try and not let the situation deteriorate my mind to a point where I will go crazy, where I will lose a sense of reality. I always try and keep a sense of reality with me. Uh, sometimes it feels very strange to wake up and be in that cage, in that cell, and uh, I don't think man was meant to be locked up in such a way. Maybe they had a thing going on in the Western days where they would just lynch the guy right off the bat. See what I'm saying? But they don't do it now like that. Carlo, do you think that's a better answer? Ramirez, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that is what they used to do back then. I'm sure the people they hung back then would have wanted to live in a cage, see what I'm saying? Especially if they were innocent. But they were lynched anyway. Carlo, how many hours a day are you actually in your cell? Ramirez, well, like I told you, the program they have me on now, which is maximum security, I got out 16 hours a week, so... Carlo, are you locked up 24 hours a day? Ramirez, on some days, some days, yeah. I go outside for about five hours on Tuesday. I get out five hours on Friday, and I go out five hours on Sunday. The rest of the time, I am on death row. Everybody has a single man cell. Carlo, how's the food on death row? Ramirez, edible. Carlo, are you able to eat with the prisoners on death row, or do you? Ramirez, they feed us in our cages. Carlo. Richard, a lot's been said about you listening to heavy metal music with satanic overtones. What influences musically inspired you? Ramirez. Well, you might do some research on this, but I think it is believed that Satan was the one that made music in heaven before he got thrown down into the pit. I'm not sure. A lot of religious people think that Satan, melodies, people believe Elvis and the Beatles with their gyrations and the beat of their music were conductive to a trance, like a uh, form of for people that they would become possessed with the music. Like I said, me, myself, I'm not sure of it, but I have an opinion. But I don't think music drives anybody to do anything. People, uh, when they're feeling bad, they listen to a song and they feel better. Carlo. When you were on the outside, Richard, before you got arrested, you listened to a lot of heavy metal music. Did it influence you? Ramirez. Influence me? It gave me a good sense of being... But the being of what I was, was already there before the music. The music just inspired me. It gave me inspiration. It reflected my feelings. Carlo. 
What was some of the music that inspired you and reflected your feelings? Tell us. Ramirez. Hmm. Heavy beats. Carlo, like what groups? What album? Ramirez. ACDC. Uh, Back in Black album. Highway to Hell album. Uh, Pink Floyd. Led Zeppelin. Black Sabbath. Judas Priest. Carlo. What about Eyes Without a Face? Ramirez. Iron Maiden. Carlo. This music you listened to a lot when you were on the outside? Ramirez. Yes, I would have a Walkman all the time, and I would take cassettes with me to play in the cars. Uh, so, that was it. Carlo, there was a song by ACDC called The Night Stalker. Ramirez, Night Prowler. Carlo, The Night Prowler. Did you used to listen to that? Ramirez, No, Phil, I didn't. Hysterical laughter. Tape shuts off. Carlo, So, did you listen to a uh, Night Prowler? Ramirez, No, I listened to Billy Idol. Flesh for fantasy. You know, lyrics that would reflect my feelings. He has a song called Eyes Without a Face that he says uh, he's on a bus, which I was always on a bus most of the time, and he says that he's reading murder books to stay hip. Uh, he's on a psychedelic trip, you know? Carlo, so basically you uh, listen to this kind of music, the heavy metal, for entertainment. Entertainment to clear your head and to, Ramirez, give me a sense of well-being. Carlo, give you a sense of well-being. Do you think young children, young teenagers actually, should be kept away from music like that? Ramirez, no, because I believe that a person that a person that is destined or inclined to be evil will be evil with or without music. Music, I don't believe, has a part in anything. Carlo, even young, impressionable minds? Ramirez, yes, yes, because I believe that it is the environment that will determine who a child will grow up to be. Carlo, Richard, when you were ten years old, Ramirez, or thereabouts, Carlo, or thereabouts, your cousin Mike had just returned from Vietnam, and he was stressed because of the war, from being in three tours of duty, and got into an argument one day with his wife and shot her and killed her. You happened to be there that day. Could you tell us how that made you feel, to see that? And later on, when you went back with your dad, Ramirez, well, yes, it was, Carlo, how old were you, ten or eleven? Ramirez. Thereabouts, I'm not sure, ten or eleven. I can't say for sure. I was probably eleven. It was a sunny day. I had been with Mike that day, hanging out, and uh, he got to his house about three p.m. I was with him. The incident happened. Uh, he was arrested, taken to jail. His, Mike's mother, called my father and my mother a week or two later, asking them if they would go into the house and get some things for them. I remember me and my father and my mother going. We parked the truck, me and my father went inside, not knowing what we would find. Tape shuts off. Ramirez. It was the strangest experience. I mean, being there after Jesse had been killed, the the aura of it was still kind of like hanging in the air. It was kind of mystical. I could still smell her blood. Sunlight was streaming into the room, and you could see particles of dust in the golden beams of sunlight. Carlo. What kind of effect did this all have on you, you think? Ramirez. Strange. I mean, to see something like that. The line between life and death right there in front of me. Intense. When she went down, I saw it all in slow motion. Carlo, he shot her in front of you, Richard? Ramirez. Yes, me and my two cousins, his two kids, boys, three and six. Carlo, how close? Ramirez, a few feet away. Carlo, your cousin Mike also killed, raped and killed women over in Nam, didn't he? Ramirez, yes. Carlo, how do you know? Ramirez, he told me all about it, and I saw Polaroid photos he had. Carlo, please tell us about that, Richard. Ramirez, he had a shoebox in his closet. It was filled with these Polaroid photographs of women and girls he took into the jungle and did. Carlo, did? Ramirez, raped and killed them. Sisters, even a family, two daughters and the mother. He tore off their clothes and had them naked, tied to a tree. In another one there, they were dead. He cut off their heads. Carlo, did he rape them too? Ramirez, yeah, of course, while they were tied to the tree, all three of them, in front of each other. Carlo, he told you this? Ramirez, yeah, told me all about it, exactly what he did. We used to go for joy rides all around El Paso, smoke pot, listen to the radio, and he'd tell me what he did with the women. Carlo, you know how many he raped and killed? Ramirez, over twenty for sure. He had photographs of them. Young girls, mostly, but all ages. 
They were the enemy. They were, you know, V.C. No one gave a fuck. Carlo, what kind, what kind of effect did this have on you? Ramirez, heavy. I used to think about them. I mean all that. Carlo, sexually, Richard? Ramirez, fuck yeah, of course, sexually. It was all about sex. Carlo, they were a turn-on, the photographs? Ramirez, yes, very much so. Carlo, do you think seeing those pictures helped you walk the road you eventually traveled? Ramirez, it's hard to say. I'm not blaming my cousin for anything. I want that clear. This just happened. Carlo, he also taught you about jungle warfare, guerrilla fighting, how to kill people, correct? Ramirez, yes, he did. How to use a knife, where to shoot someone, how to be invisible at night, a whole enchilada. Carlo, invisible? How? Ramirez, wear all black, even shoes and socks, with a black hat with the brim pulled down to cover your face so no light can reflect off it. Avoiding the reflection of light, that's the key. Carlo, interesting. Ramirez, for me it was all very interesting. I was already stealing. I mean, getting into people's houses at night and stealing things and all that helped. Carlo, did he teach you how to shoot? Ramirez, no, my dad did that. But my cousin told me where to hit someone for the maximum effect. Carlo, where? Ramirez, the head, of course. Carlo, any particular spot? Ramirez, above the ear. Carlo, and the knife, I mean, what is the best place to use it? Ramirez, across the throat. It's called a stab-slash wound. That is, you drive the point into the side of the neck, then pull it across the throat. That cuts both the windpipe and the arteries, always lethal. Carlo, I see. Tape shuts off. For me, one of the more bizarre, compelling aspects of Richard Ramirez's mind-numbing, violent story was the individuals who were so drawn to him when he was arrested. In my research for the book, I did interview many of these women and wrote about them in The Night Stalker. One of Richard's many women back then, in 1993 through 1994, was Doreen Leoy. Doreen did eventually marry Richard in a death row wedding, which I attended. The ceremony took place in the death row visiting room. As always, other inmates were having visits, and they all became respectfully quiet when the ceremony began. Here were many other notorious serial killers, heavily tattooed gangbangers, stone-faced, overly serious Aryans, all becoming quiet and still for Richard's wedding. It took place in a cafeteria-type room, 100 by 100 feet, plastic chairs bolted to the floor, vending machines lined the east wall. For me, it was kind of surreal to see all these stone-cold killers sitting there, quiet, like they were in a church or some such place, because Richard was having a wedding. The pastor, I noticed during the vows, didn't say the line, Until death do you part. When I later asked him why, he said, That would be bad form to say here, on death row. Yes, of course. Doreen Leoy had been one of many women who had been drawn to Richard after his arrest. They lined up at the Los Angeles County Jail during Richard's tumultuous 14-month trial, hoping to see Richard have a visit with him. While free, Richard had to pay for sex from lowly downtown Los Angeles streetwalkers. Now Richard suddenly was Rudolph Valentino, Mick Jagger, Brad Pitt, and the Boogeyman all rolled into one. Richard, more than anyone else, was stunned and surprised so many females found him so totally, completely irresistible. As per his instructions, some of them, indeed most of them, didn't wear underwear and would sneak him peeks at their excited charms as he masturbated himself. The old hand-in-the-pocket trick. They came in all shapes and sizes, colors and nationalities, tall and short and fat and skinny, teenage girls, women in their twenties and thirties, some of them exceedingly attractive, from all walks of society, secretaries, dental hygienists, teachers, college and high school students, a few strippers, a bank employee, postal workers, hookers, and a Satanist or two. One of the latter was Zena LaVey, the daughter of the once infamous, now deceased Anton LaVey, the founder of the San Francisco-based Church of Satan. Why, the question begs to be answered, were all these women so drawn to a cunning, remorseless, brutal serial killer, a man on trial for murdering seven women, nearly beating to death five others, raping old ladies, beating and kicking and sending them to the hospital barely alive. The crimes were committed across the wide expanse of Los Angeles County, as far south as Mission Viejo and as far north as Diamond Bar. Most of the Night Stalker's attacks, nineteen in all, 
over a 15-month span took place in lovely upscale communities. Yet here were these girls and women wanting to have sex with him, do his bidding, fellate him, be sodomized by him, make themselves his willing, malleable sex toys. Richard was being tried, it had been written about extensively, for not only vaginally raping female victims, but sodomizing them as well. These victims all knew that, and yet it didn't matter. What Richard had done, sodomizing all his victims, apparently had given him some kind of unique atavistic appeal. Indeed, to many of these women it was a big turn-on. The sodomy was more giving, more painful on their part. If that was what he wanted, demanded, they were collectively willing to pull down their drawers, bend over, and say please as they willingly spread themselves for him. During the actual trial, females filled up whole rows in the courthouse, pressing close together, preening and strutting in front of him, his very own harem. They became known as the Ramirez Groupies, so dubbed by the unbelieving, wide-eyed press. Doreen Leoy called all of these ladies, her competitors back then, Pop-Tarts, which on face value seemed uncannily accurate. As I mentioned, I did interview many of these women while researching the book, and I initially learned firsthand what was on these ladies' minds. One told me, I'd get you know, so wet when I wanted to see him. The fact that he was so dangerous, so close, yet couldn't harm me, caused me to have to have spontaneous orgasms. When the Night Stalker was released, however, I began hearing via email, phone calls, and letters sent to my publisher from scores of women from all around the world. Because of my book, I wound up appearing in twenty hour-long documentaries on the Night Stalker case. These programs were, and still are, repeatedly aired all over the world, and thus Richard's infamy and unique appeal to women spread far and wide around the globe. Also, women who lived in Los Angeles during the stalker's unprecedented reign of terror contacted me and admitted to me that they used to fantasize and masturbate that the stalker would come in their windows and rape them. Rape, for a whole host of reasons, is a fantasy reality that apparently many women secretly covet. Perhaps it is because all guilt is removed in forced sex. Perhaps it is because of strange childhood traumas associated with sex. Perhaps it is some kind of built-in mechanism that some women use to protect themselves from ever becoming a victim. One cannot be the victim of a sex attack if, in fact, the attack is craved in some strange, unexplainable way. To some degree, in any society filled with stringent rules and regulations about sex, the repression of spontaneous, natural sexual desires and inclinations, rape can become a source of erotic stimuli, not a criminal act, as indeed it is. I'm sure that many of these women didn't actually want to be raped by Ramirez. It was only a fantasy, a hidden sexual dynamic that played out in the secret recesses of their confused minds, whether they wanted it to or not. I received emails from Russia, England, Israel, Malta, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Italy, Germany, Japan, Paris, Holland, and from all over the United States, especially Los Angeles. Here were women begging for his address, asking how to visit him, wanting to know what he was really like. Even I, who had already interviewed many of these women, was taken aback and somewhat aghast by how many females found Richard so utterly irresistible. Truthfully, at first they were a bit annoying. Here are a few queries, verbatim. Oh, my God, is he still alive? Please tell me he is. The devil is responsible, not Richard. Can you please, please tell me how to write, Mr. Ramirez? Thank you for scaring the pants off me. I can't sleep with the windows open any more. Can you please, please tell me how to contact Richard? Hi, I'm a psych student doing a paper on the Night Stalker. Can you tell me how to reach Richard? I received over one hundred of these. I'm a filmmaker. I want to do a film on Richard, all these groupies of his. Please, sir, can you tell me how to visit him? After a while I realized there was a little-known, little-understood phenomenon going on, and I determined to study it and find out what the hell was happening here. I began interviewing many of these females. Here is some of what I found out, a mere slice of this bizarre element in the mind-numbing, violent complexity of the Night Stalker case. Julie. Julie is twenty-one years old, two years out of high school. She has thick black hair, large, dark, walnut-sized eyes. She lives in Paris, France. She is so taken by Richard she changed her last name to Ramirez. 
She never has been in trouble with the law and is not overtly promiscuous. She is madly in love with Richard, however, and often fantasizes about having rough sex with him in a car. Julie was brought up by her grandmother. Her mother was a prostitute. As a child, Julie saw her mother turn tricks. As a child, Julie watched porn movies that her mother left around the house. This occurred before Julie went to live with her grandmama. When twelve, Julie was taken for a ride in a car by an older man who orally raped her. He nearly made her choke when he orgasmed, forcing semen to come out of her nostrils. This is what Julie told me. I first heard about Richard on TV. I right away loved him so. He is so beautiful. I bought your book and read about him and loved him even more. I began to write him. He wrote me back. He is so nice, so sweet. My fantasy about Richard is to make the love to him in the car, like he did with the prostitutes in your book. I want him to, you know, fuck me in the ass. He likes that, I know. I want to please him. For me, this is more powerful, more intimate than in the pussy. I love Richard so much, I would do anything for him. Anything. Carol Carol actually lived in Monterey Park while the Night Stalker crimes were taking place. There were five stalker attacks in Monterey Park. She was a single child in a loveless marriage of convenience. Carol is married now, not happily, with two children. She is thirty-four and looks like the actress Jennifer Connelly, a beautiful mind. She works as a computer programmer. She told me she was fourteen when the crimes were happening, that they were all over the news. She said, everyone was always talking about them. Many of them occurred just near where we lived. I mean, blocks away. For the life of me, I don't know why, but I began fantasizing he, I mean the stalker, would come in my room and rape me. Sick, I know. I'm, this is kind of hard for me to talk about, but it's the truth. I was, in fact, raped by my mother's boyfriend. I told my mother. She didn't believe me. I used to keep my window open and hoped he'd come in. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, I was trying to get back at my mother for, you know, allowing me to get raped, then not believing me. In any event, I used to think about that. Then, when Richard was arrested, I really started having heavy sexual thoughts about him. He was, well, he was so cute and so bad at the same time. His badness drew me to him even more, you could say. You know, I was too young to go visit him then, but I did write him letters, love letters. Then I, well, I grew out of it, you could say. Now I want to go see him. I know he's married, but this is between me and him. Victoria. Victoria is Danish. As of this writing, she is twenty-two years old. She first became aware of Richard when she saw an HBO special about him and women who were drawn to him. She was sixteen then. She thought Richard very handsome, loved his big lips and high cheekbones. She then read my book and contacted me. Oh, my God, she told me. Is Richard still alive? Please tell me he is. I'm madly in love with him. We all are. There was a chat room here in Denmark devoted to Richard, and there were hundreds of girls on it, and we all talked. I want to marry Richard. I know he married Doreen, but she is only a convenience. She looks like his mother. She is ugly. I think he sees her like his mother. What do you think? He doesn't really love her. I write him letters five or six times a week. My greatest dream is to go to America and see him. I will, some day. If I could, I would like to make him breakfast and serve it to him in bed. Would they allow that? I'm saving myself for him. I know he likes virgins. He said I could come to see him. I'm going to go. That will drive all the others crazy with jealousy. Though I very much wanted to tell Victoria to get a life, I wished her luck. She'd need it. Angelina. Angelina is Italian and lives in Milan. She is a tall, lanky runway model with never-ending legs and well-formed, chiseled high cheekbones. She told me, Richard is the most beautiful man I ever saw. Those cheekbones and lips, my God, he is like a Latin god, like an Inca prince. Don't you think? I read your book after I saw the story on, I think it was the Court TV channel. I love the photographs of him as a child. My God, was he cute. I would love to make love to him. When I am with boyfriends, I close my eyes and make believe it is him, Richard, inside me. I write him and send him photos of myself, naked. He loves them. It excites me so very much that he looks at them and masturbates. I sometimes send him a little money. Not so much, but he likes that. I send him books and magazines, too. Naked women magazines. He told me he likes Asian women, so I sent him some of those. 
I want to go see him, but he tells me not to come because of Doreen. A man like him should not be married. No one woman could ever satisfy him. I'm waiting for permission from him to go see him. To hell with Doreen, you know? Monique. Monique first contacted me when she was seventeen. She lives in Hyde Park, England. She was very troubled and seeking explanations and assurances she wasn't insane, none of which I could give her. She is Chinese, polite, and quite attractive, with long, silky black hair, a heart-shaped face, big kissy lips. I think, she said, I need a psychiatrist. What do you think? I know everything Richard did. I've read your book many times over. I know whole pages by heart. It is the best book I ever read. I know he is very dangerous, like a wild animal, that he enjoyed raping and beating Asian women, yet I am so drawn to him, like a moth to a flame. It's like a sick obsession. I want him to tie me up and rape me. Sometimes I tie myself to my bed and fantasize he did it. I use different objects, all so big they hurt, like he would, and I have intercourse with myself, thinking it's him. I close my eyes, and it is so real, so bloody real, I can smell him. He smells just like you wrote, wet leather with an animal-like odor. He is like an animal, a wild, dangerous animal. That's what I like, his danger. Well, I can't honestly say I like it. I'm just uncontrollably drawn to it. To him. If my parents found out about any of this, they'd disown me, I know. I once told my sister I thought he was cute. She told me I'm sick. Do you think I am? I sometimes think I am. It all, it's like some kind of fever inside me. I can't get rid of it. I want to. I can't. Please, can you tell me if it's okay if I write him, or is it sick? I'm not one of his groupies at all. I'm, I just have this fever. If my parents knew, they'd lock me up. Do you think I should be locked up? Sometimes I think I should. Should I write him? That's sick, don't you think? Do as your heart tells you, I told her. Definitely see a shrink, I thought. Luda. Luda lives in Moscow. She has a very white, cream-like skin, wears much makeup, is a bit overweight, but she's attractive in a dark, sultry way. She is a professional dominatrix. She abuses men for money. She likes her work a lot. She always wears erotic leather outfits that reveal her breasts and genitals. She has a golden ring through her clitoris. I have seen photographs of her naked. Like thousands of women, she has sent Richard nude photographs of herself. A while back, Richard wrote me and told me he had so many photographs of naked women, he couldn't fit them all in his cell. He asked me if I'd hold a few for him. I said yes. He sent me a thick, big manila envelope brimming with photographs of women and girls. Many of them were naked quite a few beaver shots. Luda's photo was among them. Since the recent conviction of Scott Peterson and the women who wrote to him subsequently, the media has newfound interest in this little-known bizarre phenomenon, women drawn to killers, the infamous. Compared to Richard Ramirez, however, Peterson is like an innocent, wide-eyed altar boy lost in the woods. According to Vinell Crittenden, the public relations liaison at San Quentin, no ten inmates put together ever got more mail from females than Richard. He gets hundreds, boxes filled with mail every week, he recently explained. It is my dream to have sex with Richard, Luda told me in heavily accented English. He is gorgeous. He is the ultimate man. I would love for him to dominate me. I want to be his slave, his sex slave. I swear I'd do anything for him, anything. I mean it. I don't care for normal sex at all. It's boring. All these men come to me and pay me all this money to abuse them. They are a joke. Men are a joke. But Richard, he is my god. Tamara. Tamara is built like Jessica Rabbit. She lives in Sherman Oaks, Los Angeles. She is an avowed vampire. She sleeps in a coffin, has had her canines filed into points, is erotically aroused by the sight and taste and smell of blood. She works as a secretary for the city of Los Angeles. She covers her canines with caps. Tamara is in her mid-thirties today. When I first spoke to her, she was twenty-four. She has an altar in her bedroom devoted to Richard. It contains many photos of him, statues, burning candles, different crystals, quartz, and amethyst. One of the quartz crystals is in a penis shape. Tamara uses it to masturbate. She explained, My greatest fantasy is to have sex with Richard in a cemetery at night, on a black tombstone with only the light of the moon. I want him to fuck me with blood on his penis. I mean, 
I want our sex to be lubricated with the blood of one of his victims, and you know what? I'm not ashamed of that at all. I know you think I'm nuts, but I'm not. I'm just honest. That's what I love about Richard. He never judges me, doesn't think I'm out of touch at all. He is one of the few people, perhaps the only person who understands me, who can understand people like me. There are a lot more people, women, who would love to do what I just said. Wild, crazy things. I know a woman who wants to be murdered by Richard as he fucks her. For her, that would be nirvana, the ultimate. Who? Tell me who has the right to judge anyone about what they like sexually. No government, no church, nobody has the right to police your passions. If it was wrong, against God or nature, I wouldn't feel it. I wouldn't think this way. Just the fact that I have these desires and needs makes them right. I mean, I don't want to force myself on anyone, force anyone to do something they don't want, involve children in any way. Consenting adults should be able to do whatever they please. Period. End of story. The church, isn't that a joke? Them telling people what is right or wrong when it is filled with child rapists. Hypocrisy. Talk about hypocrisy. As of this writing, in 2005, Richard is still housed in San Quentin E. Block, death row. It is now 16 years since he was sentenced to death 19 times by Judge Michael Tynan. The average stay on death row across the country is 13 years. To some degree, Richard has become used to incarceration. He has books, a TV, and a radio in his 6 by 8 cell. He gets hundreds of pieces of mail a week from all around the world, mostly from females. He has a lot of correspondence to keep him busy. There has been much talk across the country about abolishing the death sentence, which very well could come to pass. If that does happen, Richard would be spared the lethal injection San Quentin now uses on the condemned. As of this writing, there are 667 men waiting to die at San Quentin's death row. Richard is one of the most infamous of all the condemned, a kind of homicide superstar, the Mick Jagger of murder. Richard's attorneys are planning to appeal his conviction. His appeals attorney, Jerry Russell, says there are numerous legal points she plans to perfect and argue, foremost of which is incompetent counsel. When recently asked when she will have the appeal ready to be argued, she said, Well, truth is, it is a voluminous record, and I won't have the appeal ready for quite some time. The truth is, she told me off the record, there is no hurry to argue Richard's appeal, for the longer she takes, the longer Richard will live. He might very well live to a ripe old age and die in prison of natural causes. Then again, San Quentin's death row is a very dangerous place, and there is no telling when sudden violence can occur, and Richard could end up dead. Meanwhile, Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, reads his fan mail, enjoys all the photographs of naked women sent to him, and dreams about being free so he can do all the grisly, ghastly things he did to get put on death row in the first place. Philip Carlo, Montauk, New York. This concludes The Night Stalker by Philip Carlo, narrated by Tom Zingarelli, copyright 1996 by Philip Carlo. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Kensington Publishing Corporation and was produced in the year 2016 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto.